but as you can see from these pictures here what a beautiful day it is in the Tour de France today in the Pyrenees everybody's saying Paul that this is undoubtedly the toughest day of the Tour de France today uh, with so many climbs tomorrow with the finish being a long way after the Col Beast, the last climb of the day it should level out a little bit there is always the possibility when the final climb of the day is so far from the finish line to recover and pull yourself back into the bike race if you have a hard day today on these final two or three first category climbs you could see yourself losing between five and ten minutes and that's what the climbers are trying to do to Armstrong today put him into difficulty every time they reach the climbs they've been waiting for this we've had no attacks on Armstrong's jersey over the flat stages but Richard Virenk loves the mountains and he is looking to try and do something for France well he's won in the Pyrenees before and he's shooting away he's won in the Alps as well for that matter but these are the other mountain chain the Pyrenees and look at the acceleration now he is streaking after the mountain point I'm not so sure Paul is going to check for me whether there's any points left because oh there will be it's a first category climb and he's just trying to take Tonkov well look at that no not Tonkov um, number the uh, little rider there who was fat as in yes he's just gone over the line and got pipped there on the line there's the result the leaders we missed them unfortunately our cameras went a bit funny but Ellie went over the top from Gomez in first place and here comes the peloton just on 45 seconds behind the six leaders as we look down now on a strange compilation of the Tour de France today because the climbers have already got rid of most of the followers in that big pack very select bunch now chasing off over the top of the Col de Monte as they now go down to the valley below before the next climb there's a lovely picture for you the long descent now of the Col de Monte we're chasing six leaders remember Odrio Zola, Gonzalez, Galdiano, Ochoa, Gomez, Perron and Eli who won the climb over the Monte and uh, one minute they're saying is the time gap now back to Richard, Varenk and Farazin and just a few seconds then to the main group containing Lance Armstrong what do you reckon Paul down here 80k an hour or more they'll be touching 80k an hour up to 90 kilometers an hour and this is the sort of climb that Sean Yates really would have loved <laughs> these are the kind of corners that he would have taken incredible risks to go around and I was just thinking uh, a couple of days ago that Sean Yates must be sitting looking at this and thinking oh, I wish I could have ridden a couple more tours de France just to be able to ride with Lance because they were great friends and Lance Armstrong learned an awful lot about bike racing from Sean Yates and I would think Yates now thinking I wish I was on the front of that group pacing Armstrong down this descent indeed he would have given them some pain and kept uh, Armstrong as fresh as a daisy I think but unfortunately you get old and you have to retire when you get too old to pedal your bikes at these sort of speeds and when you go on descents like this I think your nerve tends to go a little bit too uh, when you get a bit older anyway the race on the way down now we're in pursuit of six leaders the Mayo Jean at the moment has all of his main rivals around him Welcome back to Tour Plus on Channel 4. This is our commentary position, although at the moment it looks like organized chaos. It's actually from here that images go not all over Europe, but all over the world. And it's also a place where I get a chance to meet some of the rogues I used to race with. This is where Tony Rominger commentates for Eurosport. Russell Williams, a former British champion. Jean-Francois Bernard, a winner of a stage of the Tour de France. And right at the end of our commentary position here, Pedro Delgado, a winner of the Tour de France. He knows exactly what it's like to ride this race. Thank you, Paul. Well, we're all getting used to the switches on this year's Tour de France in the commentary box now. As we look now on the Tour de France, they're on Spanish territory and they're riding up towards the top of the Col de Portillon, which will take them back into France. Only 20 kilometres today spent in a foreign country and uh, really very quiet roads as well. But the breakaway strengthened to seven after the descent of the Col de Monte because Kurt van der Wauwe got across for the Lotto team. He's a Belgian rider and I think. Uh, uh, in the future going to be one of the best Belgian climbers we've seen for some time probably since the days of Claude Coquillion that's where we are now 88 and a half kilometers covered De Wauer, by the way is lying 19th in this race slipped a little bit since the Alps he rode well in the Alps he is a climber he's 16 minutes down but there has been a general regrouping here a lot of riders have chased back and as you can see the US Postal have got themselves organized once more a lot of riders taking major risks on the descent of the last climb the Col de Monte to try and get themselves back into the big group at the front unfortunately for Lance unfortunately for Lance Armstrong Christian van der Velde Frankie Andreu and George Hincapi have managed to get back up which is why we've got the uh, blue white and red jerseys of the US Postal Riders sitting at the front of the pack setting the pace again and that will be the order of the day for as long as these guys can keep themselves in the main peloton with Lance Armstrong 
About eight and a half kilometers uh, still to climb here up the Col de Portillon. And that'll take us back into France at the Haute Garonne, Department of the Haute Garonne, which is where we were at the start of the day at Saint, uh, Saint Gaudin. And we've seen a lot of movement here, but let me remind you of the breakaway as it stands at the moment with Jan Audio Zola, uh, Alvaro Gonzalez Galdiano, Javier Oschoya, Jose Javier Gomez. They're all Spanish riders, four of them in the breakaway. Then we've got the Belgian Kurt van der Wauer, and then we've got the two Italians, Andrea Perron and Alberto Eli. There they are, and they're being led at the moment by Eli, his coattails flapping. There also, just caught a glimpse of him at the back there in that red jersey, was the man that was last to come up, uh, Van der Wauer. And I know that will make the Belgians very happy because they've got great uh, hopes for this young man. I think it's a good move by him too to try and move himself right back into the top ten places in the top. Number 86 he is, and he's riding one of those competition bicycles of ours as well, so I hope he handles it with care. <laughs> They're having a really good day, this leading group of riders at the moment, because their lead stretched out once again. Every time the time checks come through, it's getting bigger as the race goes on. Four minutes and 40 seconds was the last time check, and obviously no major chase now in the main group behind, because Armstrong is not too worried about the position of Andrea Perron in this group, even though Perron is 15th overall. He's 13 minutes behind in the overall standings, and I don't think on a mountain stage like this we're going to see the big time gaps that we saw over the last three stages, which were on the flat roads. Well, the arrival of Van der Wauer in this breakaway puts him second best, uh, second best on the overall classification. 19, 16 minutes, 16 seconds behind Armstrong. Andrea Taffy, uh, Andrea Taffy, listen to me, rather, Andrea Perron, who is the best place rider in the breakaway, 15 to 13 minutes and 32. And Perron having one of his best tours here. I'm amazed to see him climbing as well as he is. He's really in this group thinking more about the position of Abraham Alano later on in the day. Abraham Alano is second place in the overall standings and that's what the Onse team are trying to do they're looking after Abraham Olana's position on the podium at the end of this three-week event because certainly if anything at all happens to Lance Armstrong over the next couple of days in the mountains if he manages to if they manage to crack him on one of these big climbs then it'd be Abraham Olana who will be in the driving seat ready to take over the lead at this year's Tour de France we're very close to the Spanish border here, so obviously all the Spanish teams are on a high at the moment. They want to perform well, and you can see the difference in the number of Spanish spectators who've come across the border here to support the Tour de France today, and they would love to see a Spanish victory. Well, you can bet on that. I think the French might like to see a, a French victory too, because at the moment we're on course to have the worst Tour de France as far as stage results go for the French since 1926. That's an awful long time to go back for the French to have to wait for a stage victory. I'm sure they will get one before the end of the Tour, and if they don't, it will really be a sad day for French cycling, which hasn't really shone at all during this Tour de France. The pressure at the front of the group now being set by Bernesto has actually reduced the advantage of the leading group of seven riders down to 3 minutes and 50 seconds. 3.50 it is, and they're not really chasing those men out front. They're just keeping the tempo going. In fact, Bernesto have a man up there in Jan uh, Odrio Zola. Well, Vitalico have one man, Gonzalez Galdiano, Kelme have two men, Javier Hotsua and Jose Javier Gomez, and Lotto, Onse and Telecom, one man each in that breakaway. But obviously the, the things going on here is Team Bonesto are trying to isolate Armstrong, they're trying to blow that group apart. They were surprised to see how many riders came back after the descent of the Col de Monte, and after that long flat valley section, we had a very large group starting the foot of this climb, the Col de Portillon. Now you can see the main field is stretching out into a pretty long line there, and a lot of the non-climbers will be getting dropped off the back of this group again. Well, the roads are good. We're looking back into France here and away from Spain. Just 20 kilometers or 12 miles spent in a foreign country today uh, for the Tour de France this year. It's not unusual for the race to go across borders here in Central Europe, as the riders, uh, as we know from the Past experiences of the race last year, starting in Dublin in 1994, it was in England. I've even talked of the race going to the United States in years gone by, but I think working out the jet lag, it is a little bit ambitious. A logistical nightmare, I would say, trying to get all the riders, all the equipment and all the organization across the Atlantic and back again just after a couple of days on American soil. But maybe one day in the future it will happen for the moment. I don't see it happening this, uh, this millennium. Well, that's a pretty... Pretty shrewd move, that Paul, yeah. As we now look down here at Van der Wauer, riding on the climb. 
this French rider, this Belgian rider, who does look to be a climber in the making here, is second Tour de France, finishing 16th last year, 19th overall at the moment, had a great passage through the Alps, but on those long transitional stages, funnily enough, he slipped about three places overall, but nothing serious, and I've got a feeling he's going to climb back up the rankings today. Alberto Eli was the man on the front with the pink and white jersey of Team Telecom. And Andrea, Andrea Perron now, seeming a little worried about the composition of this group, keeps looking over his shoulder, sitting at the back of the group, doesn't want to, in fact, take any part in the pacemaking because he's thinking about the tactics later on in today's stage when he's going to have to do an awful lot of work to protect his team leader, Abraham Alano. Round one of the big pieces of granite here that make up the Pyrenees. Perron, the rider second back here, uh, we just um, remembered in the last couple of days the uh, rider Fabio Casatelli, who was the champion of the uh, Olympics and who sadly was killed on the descent of the Col de Porte Aspe a couple of years ago now. And uh, the memorial to him is on that climb. And a number of the members of the organization went across on the rest day to pay homage. And Perron was, in fact, uh, the roommate of that cyclist on the same Motorola team the year he got killed. Armstrong very conscious of that fact because he was also a, a good friend of Fabio Casatelli and also a very good friend of the Casatelli family and in fact the, the relationship still goes on despite the fact that uh, Fabio Casatelli disappeared more than four years ago. The leading group of riders though Phil are still working exceptionally well together but in the main field again it's coffee trying to get themselves across to the group. This is again Roland Meyer. The, um, the brother of Ermin Meyer, the Swiss national champion. He's trying to get off the front, and again, the reaction coming very rapidly from Bonesto. Bonesto picking up the pace. They don't want anybody to get off the front of this group because they've obviously got some tactics uh, in the back of their minds. One or two got off the back, Paul, because this steady tempo by Bonesto, and now as we get further up the Col de Portion, the attacks are beginning to move. They have dropped uh, Francois Simon from this group and also gone. A little bit of a surprise. Alexander Vinokurov has also been dropped by the bunch. He was in that earlier move, remember, but he's paid the price now because this steady tempo has taken him off the back. And once again, this rather compact group beginning to thin out as we head up now towards the top of this col. The time gap for the leading group of seven riders coming down all the time because of the fresh pressure on the front of this group. The last time check is three minutes and 30 seconds as Roland Meyer tries to get himself away from the main field. But again, it's the Spanish teams taking up the chase behind Bonesto and a rider from Once there trying to come across. And of course, joining in the third Spanish team as well, a man from Vitaligo Seguros. Yeah, Roland Meyer here, such an aggressive rider. He hasn't actually won a bike race since 1997 when he won a stage of the Grand Prix William Tell in Switzerland. But uh, that doesn't say he isn't a great bike rider because he is a most aggressive rider. And unlucky, I think, not to have won a stage of this tour so far. But he's trying to get clear at the moment. Second place, the Onse rider is David Echabaria. Went over a stage of the tour just a couple of days ago today, proving, proving his mountain climbing prowess. And as you can see in the main field, there is no reaction. The work on the front being done still by Frankie Andreo, trying to survive at the front of this group and stay with Lance for as long as possible in the mountains, because he knows that that is going to be the big danger point for Armstrong, being isolated as we go into the final couple of climbs. Well, actually, uh, David Echeverria has come up here to Roland Meyer. He's the man in the middle. Uh, we talk about him as a spinner because of his style and build, but in fact, he's an extremely good climber and has won the Tour de l'Avenir before now. And so he is a rider who won't be afraid of the climbs today and will no doubt know them too because he is a Basque. The Benesto rider in the group is uh, Jose Luis Arieta. He's got a cross there for our man Alex Zula. And again, it's always the Bonesto riders at the front launching the attacks. Again, they've come out today on a mission. This is Tonkov coming up through now. And again, a rider from, uh, in fact, Laurent Dufo. I thought it was yeah. Vitalico, but Dufo again on the slope of this climb going on the attack. Deja vu, Paul, as of the previous climb. They are now going to use the last five kilometers or so of this mountain to see if they can again hit back at Lance Armstrong as they did on the previous climb of the Col de Monte. Once more, Frankie Andreo doing his best to lift the tempo, but not doing anything silly, and Lance Armstrong allowing Dufo to make his move. Never panics at all, Armstrong. He leaves it up to his teammates. He's got complete confidence 
in the work that they are doing for him. Frankie Andeo today is riding above and beyond himself because Frankie is not normally renowned for his ability to ride on the mountain slopes, but he's urged on by the fact that the yellow jersey is in their team and he's really pushing himself hard. Well, just look at the way Dufault has pedaled up here to that group and uh, contains David Echeverria. There is the Armstrong group and another rider diving off the front, none other than Fernando Escartin. He's not the best of stylists, but my goodness me, he makes that bike go up a mountain. Well, Armstrong responding ah. now. He knew exactly that this was the He's most the dangerous man. man. Most. This is the man he fears most in the climbs, as well as Alex Zuller, and they've caught Zuller napping. Armstrong has gone immediately after number 111, Fernando Escartin, and he's decided now, if this is going to be the tactic of the climbers today, I'm going to have to go with them. Zuller has followed suit, as has uh, the Angel Casero, the Spanish champion, and getting in there as well, the polka dot jersey of Richard Virenk. So, the battleground again has given way now to the stars of the Tour de France. Armstrong has always said he is worried about Fernando Escartin, so he reacted personally as soon as uh, Fernando went, and Zuller had no choice but to react. Those two riders and Armstrong. Uh, Abraham Olano, a low second overall, uh, seems to be the second bit player in this event. Abraham Olano is not a great climber, he's a very strong rider. He comes from a, a background on the track. He climbs these mountains with power, so he hasn't got the acceleration of men like Escartin or Alex Zuller. What he has to do is let them go and ride himself back into the group at his own pace. Alvaro Galdiano Gonzalez is the rider on the back there for Vitaligo Seguros. But the main pressure on the front of this group all of the time is being done by the Kelme squad. And this is Javier Ochoa, just a couple of days ago involved in an accident. You can see he still has a, a bandage on his elbow there, but he's recovered very nicely. Thank you to, to get back up and be at the front of the Tour de France, because this really is the terrain of the Kelme squad. They are a great, aggressive mountain climbing team, and it seems as if a certain amount of order has now returned to the front of the main pack. Well, they'll keep on testing Armstrong, but if he reacts, of course, they'll stop. And uh, although our information is coming that the leading seven riders are only 30 seconds in front, I'm not sure that's right. In fact, they've just amended it to three minutes and 30 seconds, which is what we thought. So they are still clear. And the pacemakers are Driozola and Alvaro Gonzalez Galdiano. And there the boys doing the work in that group. As uh, all of a sudden, it's a very select little bunch of cyclists down there of all of the heads of the Tour de France. And uh, Abraham Olano is the one that we would like to see come up to the front, but he hasn't done much yet. What this has done, though, is again reduce the number of teammates that Lance Armstrong has got with him. There's just one in there at the moment, and I think one recovering at the back. That may well be Kevin Livingston coming up. And again, the attack's coming. This time it's Mappé, this time it's Paolo Lanfranchi going off the front, trying to set something up for Tonkov. Well, the reaction is straight there immediately as uh, Paolo Lanfranchi, not himself a big winner, but he is a great uh, pacemaker for Tonkov, and he started to go now. He's almost tempting them to come and join him. Well, he won't have to tempt them too long because here they come, and this, this bunch already down to around about 20 riders. But one or two riders did recover on the, uh, the fact that that group slowed down and it swelled up, especially from riders coming up from the rear. And maybe fr uh, uh, Lance Armstrong's teammates, Kevin Livingston and Frankie Andreo, managed to recuperate and get back in there. Only around about two kilometers from the summit of this climb. So if Frankie Andreo, for example, doesn't lose more than a minute over the summit of this climb, he'll have a big chance to recuperate and come back in. Well, let's hope you're right, Paul. But right now, as we see this group. Uh, have a little bit of an infighting session. They've uh, chopped off 35 seconds off the leading six up front, so it's 2.55, the latest time check now. As they continue here to keep the pace high, look at each other, they're all sort of saying, who's going to make the next move, guys? Well, the next move again coming from Roland Meyer, the Swiss rider on the coffee disc team. He certainly wants to get off the front today, but nobody's giving him a, a ticket to leave the main field because as soon as he got 20 or 30 metres off the front, the reaction came, and again the reaction coming from the Spanish teams. Vitaligo Seguros putting a man across there almost instantaneously, and Onse, but again, Meyer attacks on the slopes of this climb. He really wants his day out. Well, he deserves success, this man, because he really does make the big effort, and once over the top of the Portillon, it's a 12-kilometer downhill descent right into the spa town of Luchon. And then, I'm afraid, the only way out is up the Col de Perisor today. It's once uh, the mountain where Tom Simpson uh, wore the yellow jersey in the tour. Now, quick reaction there by 161, Alex Zula hanging on to the back wheel of Pavel Tonkov. And if our camera pans right, will we see yellow? Because the yellow jersey of Lance can't allow this one to go. 
Well, that was a good move, very smart move by Alex Zula there. He used the acceleration of Tonkov to go across to this leading group of riders, but they haven't got too far off the front. In fact, the effort made on the front of the main group has come from the Onsei squad. Armstrong still comfortably in this leading pack of riders, and I have to say that the, uh, the attacks certainly are coming all of the time today. It's going to be a long, hard day in the saddle for Lance Armstrong because the climbers have certainly decided today they're going to go out and try and break this man. Well, I've got to hand it to both the attackers and the defendant here because they are riding a great Tour de France from what, we're, from what we are seeing here. They are much more open tour than the previous years. They are hitting the leader, and the leader so far has all of the answers. There's Armstrong on the left of our pictures. We look down there and just seems to be controlling things as he wants to, but the others will not lie down. They are launching attack after attack. He's very calm and collected when these attacks come. He doesn't panic at all. He responded to only one. The one that he felt was the most dangerous, that was the one from Fernando Escartin. But he'll keep a very close eye on 161 in the white and blue jersey there of Alex Zula because he knows as well that Zula is a man to be feared. And he doesn't want to give Zula too much of time back because if it comes down to the time trial and they have to time trial it out at the end, well, that would be a real mano against man. Up to the leaders, the only uh, rider in the top six overalls who hasn't launched an attack yet is Abraham Olano. Is he saving himself? Heading up towards the top of the Col de Portillon, and this is the gateway back into France. There you can see the profile as well. An 11 kilometer plunge down the mountain after this. And look at this, the Belgian rider Van der Wauer sprinting clear and snatching the points at the top. Well done to him. And Otoya was the man over there in second place. So they're on the way down, Paul, having uh, snatched all the mountain points. Watch out for the polka dot jersey of Richard Veronk now. He'll want uh, the eighth place place over the top and uh, gain maximum points as far as this bunch is concerned. Well, Veronk moving up on the left hand side there in the white shirt with the polka dots on thinking about getting eighth place. Lance Armstrong, Phil has moved right up to the front line now just to show the other riders in this group that he's still good and he's still feeling comfortable. Laurent Dufault on the left-hand side in the red jersey on the, on the wheel of his teammate, the Swiss champion Armin Meyer, has been the most consistent attacker so far. He certainly wants to try and put this race into difficulty today as we drag our way through the Pyrenees. Well, I'm sure Belgium will be pleased to see a man playing in the mountains with the big climbers because it's a long time since Claude Coquillion was able to do that. And Lucien Van Impe, the little Belgium who won the King of the Mountains title, a record equaling six times. He's the man that's done it six times, along with Federico Baramontes, the Eagle of Toledo from Spain. There's the other man who, after this year, will have, probably have five, and next year could be shooting uh, to join them in that competition with six wins. What a great job by Frankie Andrea. He recuperated there. He was dropped when the big accelerations came, but he knows what his job is today. Every time he's dropped, he tries to keep his rhythm going so he doesn't lose too much time, and he rides himself back into the group when they slow down. And as soon as he's back into the group, he's on the front, setting the pace to keep US Postal in the driving seat for as long as possible. And there we have the polka dot of Richard Baronk, just keeping tempo at the front, waiting for the chance to sprint for the line. The last time check we got was 2.55, so these riders are not far from the summit now. As the tempo quickens, and Frankie is going to find a flurry of men around him here, racing for mountain points, and he won't worry about that. He's done terrific on this climb, and he's still going to be with Lance on the way down to Luchon. So it'll be the Col de Perisord next for the US Postal team. Armstrong moving up alongside Frankie just to get onto his wheel here. He's looking very calm for the moment, Phil. He doesn't look to me as if he's having any problems at all with these early slopes of the Pyrenees. And in uh, third position, moving up very closely, Richard Verenck. Armstrong's face doesn't reveal any emotion at all. It's complete and utter concentration, and you can't even tell whether he's suffering or not. But he looks to me as if he is very comfortable. So there we have him going clear now for the sprint. Easy, wasn't it? Maximums points from this bunch for him. Richard Veronk continues to build a lead in the King of the Mountains competition again. Just on about 2.30 was the time gap. And Mariano Piccoli scoring well. He's had a good day so far. He won the climb of the Col des Arts at the start of the day. And he's gone over there in about uh, ninth position, it would be, I think, yeah. And he's not going to give up a, with his quest to try and take that pink King of the Mountains jersey off Richard Verenck. And he's going to push Verenck, the Frenchman, all the way to Paris, I reckon. So there again, the scenery of the Pyrenees as the riders now twist their way down towards the bottom and the lovely town of Luchon. Once we get there, we're on the next climb. With
Welcome back. Anybody who knew me as a cyclist knew I was a non-climber. I hated the mountains. Nice to look at, awful to ride up. The important thing, though, is it's a complete difference in the kind of gears that you use. Nowadays, the, the riders on these climbs will be using the smallest chainring here on the inside. That's a 39-tooth chainring, and that will be combined with the biggest sprocket that they've got at the back, which today will be a 23-tooth sprocket. But the men going for the win in the overall standings will have to use one or two sprockets higher because the big attacks are going to come. Escartine and Zulla will be looking for Armstrong's scalp, and he's going to have to defend himself all the way up to the summit of this climb today. Well, thanks, Paul, and everybody gearing up now for another attack on Lance Armstrong here because they have left the yellow jersey eight kilometres up the climb of the Col de Perosord. There has been an enormous attack from uh, Fernando Escartin, and he's been joined by Laurent Dufo, and they have flown up here. Tonkov tried to get on. He simply couldn't make it, and he's gone straight back into the group containing Lance Armstrong and Alex Zula. The six leaders are breaking up as well, and slowly but surely we're picking them off. They could not match at all the speed of Fernando Escartin as soon as he took off here on the slopes of the Col de Perisord, and Tonkov was popped off and picked up by the group of Lance Armstrong. Currently, the situation on the road is there are five leaders. There were originally seven, but that group is starting to split. There's a chasing group of three, which is the group we're looking at right now. This is Escartin, Dufo, and Garcia, the Vitalico Seguros rider in third place. And we have to wait another one minute and 55 seconds to the group of Lance Armstrong, the yellow jersey. He's currently 55 seconds behind Escartin on the road. But the big advantage Armstrong has now is, in fact, it's just us, Escartin, who's attacked. So he will get some help later on, I think, from the Bonesto squad of Alex Zulla. Well, this is showdown time yet again on a call in the Pyrenees today. Armstrong looks OK. He's got Kevin Livingstone with him and Tyler Hamilton. Uh, and he hasn't panicked yet, but he's seen his deficit go out to a minute on two principal players here, number 74 and number 111, Escartin and Laurent Dufo. Now we can go back to the yellow jersey group. He is still using his two teammates, not his own energy at the moment, to take this race up the hill, so it's a good sign he's not panicking. At the end of this Tour de France, Lance Armstrong owes these two guys a big beer because they have been fantastic in the mountains. On the front now, Tyler Hamilton with his jersey ripped open because it is very hot today in the Pyrenees. And sitting in second place is Kevin Livingston, his very faithful lieutenant. Livingston is really riding above and beyond himself because he's still recovering from a very bad crash in the Alps. And Armstrong hasn't panicked. He's let one of his adversaries go clear, but he will now keep a very close eye on Alex Zuller, who's sitting right behind him in this group. Well, I took a look at Zuller's face, Paul, on that climb. When that tank went, I don't think Zuller could go with it. Well, it was so fast, it was unbelievable, the speed. I had to check to make sure we actually were going up a mountain. <laughs> Armstrong being very sensible, keeping himself topped up with liquid, because on a stage like this, Phil, if you lose around about 10% of your body weight, you lose around about 20% of your efficiency, which is why Armstrong is keeping himself full of fluids. Well, he's on the climb, there's the man in second place, or in third place rather, that two-second, three-second margin behind Alano. We have seen Alano in this group, he's still in this group, but he's not coming up here and mixing it with the rest of the men. Dufo was magnificent in attack, and so too was Escartine. They took a Garcia along for the ride. Now, we know that two riders have lost contact with the original six at the front. We've had uh, Adriozola has come back, Ajoa has also come back. At the moment, the only guys left up front are Gonzalez, Galdiano, uh, Jose Javier Gomez, uh, Van der Voa, Peron, and Alberto Eli. They are up front. They're being chased by Garcia, Escartin, Dufo. Odriozola has come back. And uh, Laurent Dufo joining forces now with Fernando Escartin. Escartin being drawn uh, by the fact he's Spanish, he's raced through his own country today. He knows he'll get a lot of support when he arrives at the finish at Pio Angali. And he's up there now, pushing forward with Garcia of Vitalico. And uh, the three of them are making ground on the leaders. There are the leaders as well, and they've slowed right down, Paul. Well, the last official time check we had was 35 seconds, but I make it around about <laughs> 15 myself. The speed that Fernando Escartin is going up this climb at the moment is quite remarkable, and he'll soon very much join that leading group and find he has a teammate up there who will be able to help him. His teammate in the leading group of five riders is Jose Javier Gomez. He's sitting at the back at the moment, looking over his shoulder, and he'll be happy to see the face of his team captain coming forward. This is what he wanted. This is why he attacked in the first place, to soften the road up for him, 
and now Escartine, the true captain he is, is now slowly but surely coming up to his teammates, and his teammates sitting at the back of that group will be so delighted to see him. Everything going according to the Kelmay plan at the moment. As soon as this group gets onto the back of the leading group of five riders, we will see a turnaround in the pacemaking at the front. The green and white jersey of Gomez will certainly ride to the front of this pack, and then we will have an eight-man lead group. And that is going to be very dangerous, because once over the top of the Col de Peresord on the Valley Road, they will be able to work together and start to build their advantage before they reach the foot of the next climb. Well, this race taking on... Uh... A new face now with the arrival here of four riders, well, three riders, because uh, poor old Audrey Zola has gone right through. So three more come on. Francisco Garcia, Fernando Escartin, and Laurent Dufault have joined the leaders. The significant thing is the riders, fourth and fifth overall in the Tour de France, are now in a position of power. Gomez coming immediately to the front. He, his morale will be bolstered by the fact that Escartin has come up. This is the plan that Kelme had for today, to send riders out into the early breakaways, to have as many men up the road as possible, and then it was the launch pad for Escartin, because he knew once he started to catch the groups up the road, he would have teammates able to help him, which is why now Gomez has gone to the front of this group to put the hammer down. But Laurent Dufault's presence in this group as well is a big danger for Lance Armstrong, because Dufault himself, fourth overall at the start this morning, Morning and fifth overall for Escartine. We've got a lot of riders now at the back of the pack, like Tonkov, like Olano and Zula, who'll be starting to worry about their positions on the podium. Well, now he's got help here now because his teammate, uh, Jose Javier Gomez, is now setting the pace. One minute 40 second back to the Mayo Jean, Lance Armstrong, uh, back in that little select leading a bunch of riders trying to now limit the gains of this little group up front, which contains Dufault and Escartine. There it is. The man in the red jersey is Casero, the champion of Spain. Up with the leadings of the second group, the polka dot jerseys there, Richard Veronk. Uh, number 161, I, I don't think he had the strength to go with that split, is Alex Zula riding on the wheel now of uh, Lance Armstrong. The Kelme rider coming back is the rider who has dropped, and that'll be uh, Ochoa. There you can see in the blue jersey on the right-hand side of Lance Armstrong, Vladimiro Belli. Just behind Belli in the white Mape jersey is Tonkov. And then we go back to Virenk. Alongside Virenk is Beltran, the Bonesto rider. And Daniel Nardello is also in this group as well, just in front of the black and yellow jersey there of Abraham Alano. So all the big names of the Tour de France are still here. Lance Armstrong then doing absolutely nothing more than he has to right now. These are nervous times for him, but he has the gaps overall this morning. He knows that. If he can just not panic, he's got a buffer of 8 minutes and 7 seconds on Dufault, 8 minutes and 53 on Fernando Escartine. Just keep it steady now because there are still two big climbs to come. Those 8 minutes could be very fragile if Lance hits the wall. It's not too critical for him at the moment because riders like Dufault and Escartine will need to take back eight minutes and then get another three or four minutes before going into the final time trial. The two riders who are going to panic before Armstrong does are Olano and Zula because they do not want to give that amount of time to the other riders who are up the road at the moment. So over the summit of this climb, Phil, I wouldn't be surprised to see Bonesto coming and I wouldn't be surprised to see Onse as we looked up there to the big final lasses of this very tough climb, the Col de Peresord. I think that's what uh, uh, Kevin Livingstone is looking at, uh, rather Tyler Hamilton is looking at there. He just took one look and he saw the zigzags of the Col de Perisord. This is a magnificent mountain if you're not in a hurry like these riders are. But uh, these two pacemakers have done a magnificent job, as Frankie Andreo did earlier, but he's gone now. Alano is still in this group, but we haven't seen him. And I'm not sure how much is left in the legs of Alex Zula at the moment, just off the right shoulder there. Tonkov here is in trouble. He was going up with the lead as he couldn't hold them. He came back to the bunch. Paulie is losing the bunch. He couldn't hold it. He's attacked consistently since this morning. He's tried to go with all of these breakaways. He got popped off that attack by Escartine. He's now being waited for by his own teammate, Paolo Lanfranchi. And one of the riders, in fact, from Onse, has just stopped at the side of the road as well. This is the toughest part of the Col de la Perisor and it's having a real big effect on Pavel Tonkov. Tonkov, the eighth man on the classification, has suddenly exploded. 
We saw him go across the gap with Dufault, and he sat up. He could not match the pace, but he hasn't been able to match the pace either now of the Armstrong group, and he's losing ground. This is a free-for-all this year's Tour de France. Armstrong knows now he's in one heck of a fight. But he's got two great guys with him. Look at the face of Kevin Livingston here. These riders have got their jerseys unzipped right to the very bottom to try and keep themselves cool. Livingston looking over his shoulder there to see what the face is like on Tyler Hamilton, and it's all about pain, and it's all about concentration. This is the toughest part of the Col de la Pera Sword. They're around about two and a half kilometers to the summit. This zigzags right up to the top and then it plunges down into the valley below and then there will be some respite for these two workers on the front. Well, back in 1962 when Britain had a wearer of the yellow jersey, the only one in Tom Simpson until Sean Yates and Chris Boardman came along. Uh, but in those days in 62, it was a mountain time trial. Tommy Simpson, the last man to start, and he lost his yellow jersey on this climb. Now you get some idea of how steep it is from that angle and look right to the top of your picture because that's where we're going one minute and 52 seconds the leading group of riders have over the yellow jersey of Lance Armstrong but there's been no chink at all in the armor of Armstrong because these two guys have done a great job on the front and you get a chance to see just how difficult it is at the back of the group with the pressure being set on this group by the two riders from US Postal a long way down the group you can see the black and yellow jerseys one of those is Abraham Alano and Alano is having a hard time today just to stay on the wheel the gap is slipping back to almost two minutes now as this man slipping back is a Benesto rider who's now blown, Francisco Mancebo. He is another man who's worked for Alex Zula today and he's now struggling to hold on to the tail. Stefan Erlo, the former champion of France, was very high in the rankings too. He was ranked sixth at the start this morning. He too has popped towards the summit of this climb, but he still has a chance to recuperate on the descent and take a few risks. At the front, Alberto Eli accelerates, followed by Van der Waal for maximum points over the top of the climb. Up to the top for the leaders, and Eli's doing well today, and so is Van der Waal. And coming over third place just behind him there will be Gomez of Kelmay. Uh, no, he wasn't. It was Escarti. And there's Gomez of Kelmay just tacked on to the back. So the leaders are over the top now. This man is losing ground after that magnificent day, which brought him up to sixth place overall. The rider who almost won at Alp d'Huez caught three kilometers from the finish. Stefan Erlo in trouble now. Lance Armstrong, though, is still limiting his losses. The last time check, 1 minute 52. The clocks will have started on the summit of the Col de Pere de Sword. There's no call for panic yet for Armstrong, and his teammates have done brilliantly. But it looks as though Tyler Hamilton has now waved goodbye to the front. Only by three places, though. He's slipped back to fifth place in the line there. He will recuperate a little over the last 100 metres or so. And then once they start to the descent, he will try and recuperate as quickly as possible because he knows there's still an awful lot of riding left before these riders get to the finish. They have to keep working with Armstrong for a lot more time at the front. A hundred, another 50 kilometres to go before we get down to the finish line. And that is why Tyler Hamilton has dropped back. Kevin Livingston doing a remarkable job setting the pace here and all all Armstrong is doing is just looking at the back wheel of his teammate and friend. So, uh, the order confirmed, there's Eli van der Wauer escorting over the top, but they'll be looking for a very, very reckless drop down now to try and open the gaps on the descent. Course, a different type of cyclist going downhills. And there's the American flag flying on the Spanish borders here in France as we're looking at the rider in the middle here, and that is Abraham Alano in the black jersey. Looks as though he's in a spot of bother to me. He's not comfortable. This rider is one of the riders who is in the early breakaway. He, in fact, is uh, Jon John Odiozola from the Banesto squad. He's going backwards. He's being caught. The acceleration near the summit coming from the polka dot jersey of Richard Virenk to take as many points as he can. The time deficit, 1 minute and 53 seconds. So the Col de Pera sword is over and behind Lance Armstrong now. But unfortunately, two men he fears most are in front. We're waiting for the official time gap, but they're saying 1 minute 50. 1 minute 50 is the time gap to the yellow jersey uh, from those leaders now. Armstrong in no hurry. He still has this race under control, I think. Armstrong dead. Uh throwing away his bottle he will keep himself topped up with liquid as much as possible he's recuperating over the top of that climb because now we have a very fast descent the descent off the Col de la Perisord is not really a very technical one and not the one where you would have to take a lot of risks but you can reach high speeds and on the descent of this Col we can expect Armstrong to be touching speeds of approaching 60 miles an hour or 100 kilometers an hour so there will be not much difference at the bottom of the climb with between the leaders and the chasing group of the yellow jersey 
Well, it's a long plunge down now, and I think a few risks called for by the leaders as they'll try to open the gaps even more. As we go down into the Val de Laurent now, this beautiful part of the Pyrenees where we were here last year as well in the Tour de France and where Miguel Indurain has made his reputation over the years gone by and so too has Claudio Chiapucci. But now it looks as though Escartin, who virtually told everybody what he was going to do today and hasn't wasted any time in doing it, and that is attack the Mayo Jean of the Tour de France. There he is, freewheeling at high speed. One Bonesto rider has joined him now as they start to go downhill as fast as they can pedal. Armstrong very comfortable there, wasn't worried at all about going to the front on the descent, getting down into a nice low aerodynamic position. But interesting to note that the Bonesto have sent a couple of riders up here to start and chase because the uh, position of Alex Zulla, third in the overall rankings, is being put into jeopardy by that leading group of riders because the two riders directly behind him, Dufo and Escartine, are in the leading group, which is now made up of seven riders. And... Uh, just in case you're losing contact with the race, I'll give you those seven names at the moment. Alvaro Gonzalez Galdiano, Jose Javier Gomez, Fernando Escartin, Kurt van der Wauer, Laurent Dufault, Andrea Perron, and Alberto Eli, who was the first over the top. They are the leaders. The latest gap is coming down. One minute, 46 seconds now. Big long line here. You can see Armstrong right up onto the wheel of Beltran. Behind him, Richard Virenk. Virenk hoping to put a good performance in for France today. And once again, it looks like the French have missed out because the leading group is made up of three Spanish riders, two Italians, one Swiss and a Belgian. There's no Frenchman anywhere to be seen at the moment in this Tour de France, and they are smarting at that. Well, Stefan Erlo clearly in trouble towards the top of the Col de Pere Sword. I think he went off late enough to be able to get back on the descent. And, uh, but then, of course, he's still got two climbs to come before the finish today. For the moment, this is a very fast descent where the riders will peak at 100 kilometres an hour because there are not many sharp bends as we get slowly down into the valley in the far distance there. They get a little bit more tortuous. And then, of course, we have to climb out of that valley again, back over the mountains. What a day this is two big mountains to come and one man in serious difficulty on on the summit of the Col de Peresur was Abraham Alano he was really having to dig deep to try and stay with the group of the yellow jersey Welcome back. The Tour de France lays down very stringent rules to the towns that want to host a stage finish at the Tour de France. And in fact, here on this mountainside behind me a few months ago, there was nothing at all. The town of Pio Angolais, who hosts the finish today, in fact had to invest an extra £60,000 to build the last 400 metres finishing straight. Added on top of that to a special area for the technical zone, their total bill came to £100,000 on top of what they would normally pay to host a stage finish of the Tour de France. Well, thank you, Paul, and I'm sure the town's going to be pretty pleased with the way the race is going so far as we come towards them, because this has been a superb day of racing. We are now on the climb here, which is the Col de Val Laurent, and this is Fernando Escartin, and he's trying to strike out for home alone. A great move by him. He's not holding anything back at all on this stage today. He's decided he's going to put everything on the first stage in the Pyrenees to try and blow people away. It's a great attack by him. I thought he would have waited a little while before we went up to the final climb of the day, but he felt that the other riders in the group with him were not going fast enough. Well, Abraham Olano is in difficulty, the rider who lies second overall, and on these pictures it confirms that Alex Zuller is now second overall in the Tour de France because there was only three seconds between them at the start this morning. So Olano is in big trouble, but the other Spanish rider in the race, Escartin, is stamping out his message in the Pyrenees today. He's looking for big time, and at the moment he is getting it. Two minutes, 23 seconds ahead of the yellow jersey of Lance Armstrong. This is a real battle in the Tour today, one we haven't seen in years. Kevin Livingston coming to the front. All of the time, though, Phil, the white jersey of Alex Zuller is marking Armstrong. He's looking at Armstrong to see if there's any sign of weakness. He's waiting to see if he, too, should launch an attack on the overall position of Armstrong at the moment. Armstrong, though, is having a great amount of work being done by his team. Tyler Hamilton has disappeared. Tyler Hamilton, at the moment, is riding alongside Abraham Alano, who's around 30 seconds behind this group. But Livingston has fought his way back to the front of the group, and he continues to pace Armstrong on the slopes of this climb well there are 19 riders uh, surviving in that group containing a uh, Richard Varenk and uh, 
Lance Armstrong, although it doesn't look like it now because it's split again there. We've lost Abraham Olano. And what I was telling you is Tonkov did come back to this group as he came down the other side of the Col de Pera Sword. So too did Stefan Erlo. Uh, but it looks like they've both gone out the back door again because this man is determined today. Now, this is the rider who withdrew from the Tour de France in protest along with all of the Spanish riders last year over the police searches and drug scandals. And indeed, at that time, he was fourth overall in the Tour de France. He could even be in the same place again by the end of the day, or will he be in yellow? Could be a lot higher. Kevin Livingston has now popped. Armstrong doesn't have any teammates left, but this now is a very select group of riders because they're all individuals. They're all single representatives from their own teams. Alex Zuller is there for Bonesto, the, the Spanish champion. Angel Casero is there. Virenk riding in there for the Kelme squad is... Um, is one of the, the best climbers that the Kelme squad have got on their ranks, and that, in fact, is Casero. Angel Casero, the champion of Spain down there. And, in fact, they look at this little rush up the outside here. This is unbelievable riding by the US Postal Rider. This is incredible riding by Kevin Livingstone. He just came round the back of them, and he's just going to keep the pace high as long as he can. Well, I can't get over this, Paul. This is superb riding by Livingstone. He knows the course pretty well today because he was here in the Tour de l'Avenir a couple of years ago. That's the only time a major international bike race has finished at the finishing line we're going to today. And Lance Armstrong must be full of admiration for this man now. Serious pain on his face. He actually went off the back of this group. He came back, fought his way, but he doesn't have anything left at all. I think he gave dropped. his last Ooh. bit of energy, Phil, and it's all over now for Kevin. Oh, well, magnificent. That's the only way to describe Kevin Livingstone's performance in this Tour de France and especially in the Pyrenees today. Now, Lance Armstrong, you are by yourself and all of your rivals are either around you or in front of you. This is the rider, though, who is shaping the Tour de France today. Three kilometres to go to the top of this climb, which is a real toughie, the Col de Val Laurent. And once he's over the top, then he plunges down into the valleys below and then he will climb to the finish. If he stays strong, he's building time all the way to the line. A very strong, courageous rider. He's decided today to go out a long way from the finish because he knows if he's wanting to do something special in the Tour de France, he needs to pull back an awful lot of time today. The impetus has gone out in the main group here, but Armstrong comes to the front, and Armstrong, Phil, has attacked. Well, this is the move now. Armstrong has waited long enough, uh, stripped of all his teammates. He's taking the job in hand. Veronk was waiting, wasn't he? Straight onto the back wheel of Lance Armstrong. Can anybody else follow? Can Abraham Alano follow? No, but can Zula? Zula must respond if he wants to stay high in the overall rankings. Virenk wasn't expecting that climb. Armstrong was very clever. Dropped to the back of the group. Zula has responded. Zula has come up to the wheel of Virenk. Lance Armstrong, though, is at the front, deciding to do all of the work himself. Virenk has cracked. Well, Richard Varong, the man who was the king of the mountains elect and probably still will be by Paris, has tried to match the man in yellow and it hasn't happened. But Zula has come up. The face of Alex Zula now, who's finished second on all of the stages so far, which Lance Armstrong has won, is now in the slipstream of the yellow jersey. Armstrong checking out to see what he's got and he's going to carry on the offensive. He wants to know who's with him. A quick look, you can see the white jersey, and there's only one man in a white jersey has been on Armstrong's tail for the whole of today's stage, and that is Alex Zuller. And Zuller, too, is about to pop. But Zuller has gone. Oh. Zuller is gone. He cannot hold Lance Armstrong. Armstrong now is out in pursuit of Fernando Escartin. This is unbelievable. He's left everybody one by one on the slopes of this climb of the Val Laron. This is a real tough mountain. Now, can he eat into the lead of Escartin? He's certainly given him a start. He certainly has given him a start, but he's flying up this mountain. Richard Virenk now trying to recuperate from that attack of Lance Armstrong. He was the first man to respond. He got up to the wheel, but just could not keep the pace. Alex Zuller was the second man to come up to the wheel of Lance Armstrong, but he too could not match the pace. But he is now beginning to recover, trying to get himself onto the wheel of Armstrong. He realizes he must stay with him. Well, you've got to admire Alex Zuller because he is a man who knows how to hurt himself so, so much. He has recovered from that acceleration by Armstrong, and despite the pain, he is slowly clawing his way back. Armstrong actually is waiting for him. He's looked over his shoulders a couple of times to see the position of Alex Zuller, but he doesn't want to ride all the way to the finish on his own. He wants some help because we've still got 35 kilometers to go to the final finish line, and Armstrong has decided, I'd better have a bit of help over the valley road. Well, I'd call that pretty intelligent bike racing, if you ask me, because he doesn't want to climb, perhaps, the final roads, but all the way up to the line by himself. Why should he? He's the leader of the tour. 
and why not enlist the help of another rider to try and reduce the gap up to Fernando Escartin. So he's dropped the cadence just a little bit and hopes that uh, Alex Zula here can recover. The big change in Lance Armstrong's climbing style, though, Phil, is the fact that he's using such a small gear these days. You can see the way he's ticking over those pedals at the moment. His RPM is up very high indeed. He's pedaling at a high ca cadence, and that is the improvement that he's managed to get in the mountains. Before, he used to climb on power with sheer strength, and you cannot hold that up over a three-week tour. Well, he doesn't seem to do a thing wrong at the moment. They're regrouping behind as uh, Veronica Casero are the riders getting back in touch there Nardello is the little man tagged on at the back here let's have a look at the time checks 241 is the gap at the moment and it looks to me as though Vladimir Belli is the other rider who's got into that chase group of four for Festina now Armstrong is riding comfortably now he knows that Alex Zuller is with him he will set the pace for the majority of this climb now and he will take major risks on the descent off this mountain because it is a very technical descent once we go over the summit and Armstrong knows this climb Phil he's ridden the whole of this stage seven hours on a wet day and he knows exactly what the climbs are like and what exactly the descents are like as well he has come here so well prepared for the Tour de France and it is all working out for him now the motorbikes have got to watch this and make sure they don't impede the progress of the Maillot Jaune and the second man overall now, Alex Zula. There's the latest checks now. 2.44 to Escartine, 3.06 already back to Richard Baronk in his group of four. Well, it's a gap, but it's not the sort of gap that's impossible to bridge, Paul. I would think Armstrong could bridge around about one minute on Escartine on the descent because Armstrong is a real madman on the descents. A lot of that descending skill he learned from Sean Yates, following Yates down the mountains in the Gruppetto in his first tours to France, but now he's going to go down these mountains chasing the leader on the road, Fernando Escartine. Well, these riders are just trying to recover from that whirlwind attack there and sort themselves back out again now. Team cars are being released and allowed to travel up to the leaders. That's a good sign the gap has opened. Now, the men are out the window behind, out the roof rather. They are the race referees, and this is when their job is at most difficult to try and control all of the team's managers who want to get up there and speak to the riders. Until the gaps are open, they won't allow those cars through. Richard Viren comes to the front of that group now to keep the pace high. In years gone by, he would have been able to match that attack, but immediately, jo Johan Brunil, the team manager of US Postal, is up there alongside Lance Armstrong, and he will tell him definitely what is going on behind. Alex Zuller takes a bottle from the car, from the, the, um, the neutral delivery van there, which <laughs> lets every rider in the Tour de France keep topped up with liquid. And they're using plenty of that today on the climbs. As we look down from the helicopter now, and here's the team manager here trying to explain to Fernando Escartin, you're clear what is happening behind. The fact is you're being chased by the race leader and by Alex Zuller as he now heads up towards the top. 142 and a half kilometers will be covered at the banner on the top here. Then he plunges down, not too far, before he'll start a long, steady slog up uh, towards the finish today of Pio and Engali. Alvaro Pino, the team manager of the Kelme squad there and of Fernando Escartin. This is one of the riders from the early breakaways coming back. In fact, this is Alvaro Gonzalez Galdiano, who was in the leading group of three a little earlier with Fernando Escartin. He too was unable to match the pace of the flying Spaniard. But now Armstrong getting some help from Alex Zuller to set the pace at the front, and Zuller will realize that Armstrong is in a great day. Well, you get some idea now the difference here because that is, Garcia is a good climber. And he's been blown away by Escar team. We're looking for Laurent Dufo, who's around here somewhere. Our cameras can't be everywhere, and this race has been blown all over the Pyrenees today. So we're concentrating on the men we want to see. That's the yellow jersey of the race leader. And, of course, the green and white jersey of the man who's put him under so much pressure today. Escar team, who is now heading up towards the summit of the Col. I can only believe that the, the referees of the race today, Phil, have decided to allow riders to yes. take drinks all of the time because of the heat, which we don't normally get here in the Pyrenees. Normally, it's illegal to take drinks on board at the st after the start of a mountain climb, but there are so many of these riders doing it, I feel sure that the, uh, the, get the permission has been given by the race referees of today, which is why Armstrong, in fact, took one on board. Well, if it hasn't been given, I think all the fines will equal, equal themselves out because everybody's doing it. As they start now stamping on those pedals, coming up towards the top of the Val Laurent. This is a long, long climb, but it'll be greeted by a short, stabby descent. Quite a tortuous one on the way down. As we are beginning to run out of road today, and Escartine is the man who is heading for the finishing line in first position. 
It's a very tricky descent off the slopes of this mountain, approaching the summit now. Fernando Escartin and all the Basque flags are out. The Spaniards have really come out in numbers today to see what they hope will be a great Spanish day. We're right up against the Spanish border, and that's why the Spanish riders have been so de de so dedicated to go out and put in a top performance. Well, there he is over the top of the Col Valeron. Fernando Escartin now gets maximum points. That wasn't what he was thinking of. He wants the stage win, and he would like to move as close as possible to the yellow jersey of Lance Armstrong. He is riding superbly, and I think Armstrong was right to await the arrival of Zola because Zola has recovered, and the two of them are going good. Armstrong, again, no, no expression on his face at all. He's just concentrated on the job in hand. He knows what he has to do. He went as soon as he saw that the rest of that group was in difficulty, and he had blew them away. Here is Laurent Dufault now in the company of Andrea Perron. Coming up to the summit of the climb, almost 35 seconds has gone by, and these two riders are caught in the middle of nowhere. They could not match Fernando Escartin as he came to the summit and launched that searing attack, and very shortly they are going to be joined, I reckon, by Lance Armstrong and Alex Zulla. Well, it was Dufault's magnificent attack on the Perisord that took Escartin up, and now Escartin has continued. And uh, there's the clock counting on the right of your screen here as Laurent Dufault stamps on those pedals as best he can now. This has been an outstanding performance by Andrea Perron as well today. This is the best we've ever seen him in the mountains, Paul. Perron will be climbing way up in the overall rankings. He may well, by the end of the day, climb over his own teammate, Abraham Alano. Just over one minute and ten seconds was their deficit on the leader, but the next couple of riders up to the summit are going to be the yellow jersey of Lance Armstrong and Alex Zulla. And as the uh, brilliant uh, outriders from the Gendarmerie Nationale of France guide the riders through the mountains today, Lance Armstrong is trying to get a clear view of exactly where Fernando Escartin is. The clock is counting. 1 minute 11, uh, Dufault and Perron have gone over the top, and now we're looking for the arrival of the Mayo Jour, and everybody else in between has gone backwards today, and they've all been passed by these two riders. A Swiss-American tandem now hunting a Spanish rider out in front. Alberto Eli coming up towards the summit now. He will be fourth over the top at 2 minutes 18. So the, you see the time gaps are still there. The crucial time we want to see is on Zula. And here they come now, Zula and Armstrong. Look at the clear difference in the rhythm as they stamp out their message on the Pyrenees. A magnificent crowd here at the top of the climb of Val Laurent. And it is still a big gap, so they haven't closed much on the magnificent pedalling of Fernando Escartin. In fact, I would say it's going to be just about the same, Paul, as they come up here. They may even be losing a little bit because it's 2.45 and the clock is still ticking. But Armstrong looks very calm. He doesn't look as if he's under stress at all. 2.53 was his deficit over Fernando Escartin, and he's still got more than five minutes to play with. Well, they, they're actually officially saying 2.50, but uh, we're not going to argue over two or three seconds. It's not going to matter at the end of this year's Tour de France. We're not seeing a battle here of Laurent Fignon and Greg LeMond like it was in 1989 when they finished in Paris eight seconds apart. We are seeing a showdown between riders who are not going to stop attacking one another till Paris, and there will be big margins one way or the other by the time we get there. Here comes Richard Baronk now, dropped by Armstrong and Zola, goes over the top in 3.29 but he never gives up either. He accelerated over the top. What he's hoping is he can accelerate on the descent now. Abraham Alano has almost got onto the back of the Richard Viron group. He's ridden up at his own pace. He's got David Achabaria just off the back. He has another teammate with him, so they too will take major risks on the descent. And Tyler Hamilton has recovered well to stay with Abraham Alano. One man we haven't seen that is Kevin Livingstone. Well, Tyler Hamilton gritting his teeth now as he continues to move up here. They're trying to keep Abraham Alano in touch and see if they can do anything on the descent, but either way, Paul, surely he's going to lose more time when he comes to the finishing climb, which stops right there on the top. If he makes big risks on the descent and goes down like a demon, he could catch the group of Richard Virenk, but that's still a minute behind the group of Lance Armstrong. But the man leading the race, taking big risks on this descent, and it is a tricky descent, is Fernando Escartin. Well, this is the descent now where Fernando Escartin has got to be in two minds, I guess. Should he take risks and go for it, make a mistake, it's a long way down without a parachute as he comes around these roads now at speeds of 80 kilometres an hour as he drives the biggest gear on his bike. And look at this, Zulla is a nervous descender, but Lance Armstrong clearly is not. 
Armstrong loves to go downhill fast. Zulu having a hard time staying on his wheel. But these are dangerous descents in the Pyrenees, Phil. There's always a lot of gravel on the road. There's always a slippery moment in the corner. If you do take risks, it's very easy to find yourself on your backside at the side of the road. But look at this now, because as we go further back down, one man has got his foot on the floor there. The brakes are full on. Oh, and he's just about round, and in fact, that's Belly. As he rocks on the grass, Vladimir Belly shakes himself back onto the road. We all breathe a sigh of relief, but they're the dangers. So the descent continues as Abraham Alano has had a puncture in the back wheel as well. When your luck is out, your luck is out. It certainly is. Vladimir Opelli must have had a pretty high heart rate going around that corner, but he's back on the main road, and in fact, he's still getting back on to the group that he was with. But in fact, the race radio telling us there's a problem with Abraham Alano because, in fact, he's crashed as well. He's crashed as well, apparently, so his back wheel must have been flat. And we've no further news on that at the moment as we go back to the leader here on the way down now. Escartine piling on every ounce of pressure he can find as he races towards the last climb of the day. He's taken a lot of risks on the way down, and he's not a great descender, but coming into this corner, he knows he has to get his gear right to accelerate as he comes out. Armstrong has been joined by Alex Zuller, and these two riders are going to go mano a mano up the final climb. Welcome back. This is the race handbook, or Bible as it's called, and it's given to every person on the Tour de France, riders included. It contains every bit of information you need to get around this 4,000 kilometer race, where the race starts, where it finishes, where it goes to. But the most important thing for the riders today is the profile. <laughs> Pretty horrible, looks like a set of shark's teeth to me. But more importantly, maybe, is this part here, which tells the riders just exactly what the final kilometers are up to the finish line here in Pio Angolais. You can be certain of one thing, men like Fernando Escartin and Alex Zuller will have looked at this meticulously, and when they reach the bottom of this climb, they're going to know exactly where they want to attack. Well, and there's just that one climb left to come now, as the riders here are on the bottom of it, and this is the man who is reshaping the overall classification in the Tour de France today, even if there won't be a yellow jersey for him at the end, because Fernando Escartin, if it were to end now, would be up to second overall, Paul. He's getting big time gaps, but not the big time gaps he needs over Lance Armstrong. Armstrong currently two minutes and 30 seconds behind, but there are two riders in the middle who we haven't seen an awful lot of, Laurent Dufault and Andrea Perron, who are one minute and 20 seconds behind number 111, Fernando Escartin. Well, behind Perron and Dufault, the group is slowly getting bigger. Here it is, being led at the moment by Alex Zula. Richard Perron has just got back onto it. Uh, and Lance Armstrong, you can see Vladimir Belli's in all sorts of problems, but he's here. Gonzalez Galdiano, Garcia, Casero, Van der Wauer, Nardello. They're the riders in this group. Van der Wauer's had a great day out. The rider on the left there with the lime green top to his racing jersey. He's been on the attack over every call today. Let me tell you straight away that Abraham Olano was last timed at over 4 minutes 15 seconds behind the leader, which puts him more than 2 minutes now behind this group here. Slipping a long way down from his second place in the overall rankings, and Alex Zuller will be the man moving up to uh, staying in third probably tonight because if the race situation stays as it is right now on the road and Escartin conserves that advantage, he will in fact leapfrog everybody and move up into second. There is Andrea Perron in the black and yellow jersey just being caught by the group of Lance Armstrong. And he's looking back to see where is Abraham Alano. Yes, indeed. And he must have been very shocked to find he wasn't in that group. And I would say extremely disappointed as well, because Perron has made no effort, if he had any effort left, to hang on to this group. In the shadow, though, of the yellow jersey of Armstrong, Casero is the third rider in line here. The champion of Spain, he's had a great day. Belly is still here, too. And uh, this group, uh, Richard Veronk was off the back of it, and he did well to get back up to it, too. He was one of the main contenders at the front of the chasing group, stirring them up to try and get up to the group of Lance Armstrong. Armstrong now deciding to go to the front and set the tempo. It's the best thing that he can do, really, setting a comfortable pace for himself and not for the others. Steady climbing by this group, and as this climb begins to steepen, I wonder if they will bring back Laurent Dufault. It's a possibility, because now stepping on the pedals again is Lance Armstrong, and I'm not sure how many of those men behind can hang on. Look at the pace accelerate, and look at the gap begins to open here, because right at the back of the line and caught on one leg is Alex Zula. I wonder if Armstrong knew he had him at the back of the line. Zula slipped to the back of the line there into about seventh position, and he could not take the acceleration, and he's popped it 
again he's gone out of the back and Richard Virenk also in serious difficulty in this group Armstrong is unbelievable on the climbs that wasn't really an attack Phil he just but went faster <laughs> that's not an attack I don't know what is because he has just gone clear Armstrong is now making his run for the finish and he's trying to do a Sestria in the Pyrenees because I think he might have left himself enough time to get up to the leader on the road today it's because he knows this course so well, having ridden it in training in the month of May in bad conditions, I have to say. But because of that, he knows just exactly when he went to make the effort. That's why he waited for Alex Zula earlier on in the stage. He didn't want to ride that long stretch of road between the two mountains on his own. And now he's gone to the, to the final five or six kilometers and he's putting the hammer down to make big time gaps again. Well, Alex Zuller, who was in third place overall, and I better reserve judgment on that right now, has been tailed off here, and it looks as though they're trying to reorganise a bit of a chase back because the second, the third overall has gone behind this group, the yellow jersey has gone ahead, and they're looking a little bit confused. Well, you see how he knew how to attack on that incline there before this downhill stretch. He's opened up a gap of around about 200 metres, but that's because he knows the course. That's the advantage of preparing specifically for the Tour de France and not riding all the other events during the season. There is the neutral motorbike, which will ride behind Lance Armstrong in case he has a flat tyre, but he's now getting to the steeper part of the climb, and his pedalling action is absolutely remarkable. Well, one thing is for certain now, this man is going to win the Tour de France. He is not tired in any way at all. It's only a question whether he's going to win the stage as well today. Well, here is the man who's tapping out his own rhythm here. He's not a very pretty star, but he's darn effective as he comes up to what is now the steep section of the course for the next six kilometres or so. Dufault, Escartine, Armstrong, those are the three names we think will be at the top of the overall classification tonight if all of this progress continues. Two minutes, ten seconds is the advantage he now has over the second-place rider on the road, Laurent Dufault, and the further 15 seconds behind is Lance Armstrong. This isn't the greatest pedalling star, but this man is a fantastic climber. He climbs on sheer courage. He's really rolling about on his bike, and I reckon he's having a problem with his knee, which he banged in the early part of this Tour de France, but he's riding through the pain at the moment because he wants to win for Spain right on the borders of his own country. We're looking down now, we're seeing him climb with tremendous effort and spirit up this climb. And the new piece of road there, completely covered in the decor of the day. Escartine's name will be there as well. As now Lance Armstrong, a yellow jersey in a Tour de France, alone on the road, trying to catch one of uh, two men in front of him and bring them back to... Now, this is the right turn. The, the climb goes right up the side of the mountain now. It's a really tough one. And don't forget the Tour de France has never finished here, but Lance Armstrong knows what's in front. He's ridden here before he came to check out these mountain stages of the Tour de France. First the time trial in Metz, then he went on to the Alps to check out the Alpine stages, then came down here to the Pyrenees, which is why he's got such an advantage over his rivals. He's meticulously prepared this Tour de France this year, and he's now on the very final slopes of this climb, the difficult ones, but it looks as if Alex Zuller is recuperating and coming back to the group of Richard Virenk. Well, there's the group in front, uh, Alex Zuller. This man will fight all the way to the finish here. He'll do his best to stay in touch. But that right turn is very cool because it says uh, Pio Angeli, Engeli is six kilometres from the top, and in fact, it's near as seven uh, because they'll see the six-kilometre ball from the Tour de France organisation uh, up on this stretch of the road. And I would think when you've had all of these mountains to cross today, a matter of 700, 800 metres wrong in the score chart must hurt those legs. A lot of that to do with the extra piece of road that the organisation of the local Arab finish here, in fact, had to put in place for the Tour de France to come. This man, Alex Zuller, is a great rider. He really was put under pressure there, but he's recovered, and he's come back to the group of Richard Virenk, but at the front, Escartine is still burning up the road. Well, what a magnificent day of racing this has been in the Tour de France today. All of the riders have played their cards and attacked one another. In the end, the strength of one man is holding off the rest of the field. The strength of this man is winning in the Tour de France. Armstrong again, that face, no emotion. No sign of panic at all, he's just doing what he has to do. He's doing his job, he's riding as fast as he can up the final few kilometres of this mountain stage of the Tour de France. Angel Casero, the champion of Spain, he's managed to slip off the front of yeah, that group with front. Richard Virenk. He too now is trying to do something for the Spanish public, which are unbelievably numerous along the slopes of this climb, but they can do nothing to uh, slow down the advance of Lance Armstrong, who's a lot further up the climb. 
Well, the latest time check we've got is 2 minutes 30 seconds up to the leader, but we no longer know which rider on the course they're basing that time check on because the groups have just blown apart now as everybody scrabbles for the finishing line at Piao Engali. And this rider, third on the road at the moment, and it can't be long before he catches sight of Laurent Dufo. Even if he can't catch him, he will see him because of the way this road switches back. Well, Dufo's doing a great ride. He went away over the top of the Col de Perisud with Escartin, and there he is. He must have been coming back slowly, slowly, Armstrong, because he realized that he had to try and pull back Dufo. And now, once he gets onto the wheel of the man with the red jersey, there'll be only one man up the road in front of him. 111, Fernando Escartin, with just five kilometers left to go. Unbelievable. Under the five kilometer to go banner, Fernando Escartin. He went for time today rather than the stage win. He certainly deserves the stage win. He will get time too that will lift him into probably the top three overall. But he hasn't got close yet to Lance Armstrong's big margin in this Tour de France. Armstrong is riding this race, and the only other rider I've seen ride like this in a Tour de France is Eddie Merckx, who I put down as the finest cyclist ever. Now Armstrong has come up on Laurent Dufo. There's only one rider in front of him and that will be Fernando Escartin. Dufault put a brave effort in today he went away from that attack on the Col de Perisord with Escartin and I don't think he would have expected to see Lance Armstrong coming back now it's the turn of Richard Viron to leave that group that he was with he too now is trying to ride himself into the top five or six places of this year's Tour de France he started this morning in seventh place ten minutes behind and now he's trying to ride himself a little higher up. He will beat this evening the best placed Frenchman in the overall rankings. And the man just in front of him was Angel Casero. The irony is he will be higher up the over class, overall classification tonight, but further behind Lance Armstrong because he's losing time to the man in yellow. Now Armstrong has come up to Laurent Dufault. What will he do? A few deep breaths and sprint away? Or will he just be content to ride to the finish line with the Swiss rider? This is the man who's in first place, Fernando Escartin, now being chased by Lance Armstrong and Laurent Dufo, then followed by Angel Casero, and then followed by Richard Virenque. So, at five kilometers to go, at two minutes 22 is the time gap, and that won't be bridged today by anybody. So, this man is making a little bit of gains. He'll certainly be up into the runner up position in the Tour de France this year. He'll be happy with his day. He went out, the team went out with a plan to try and blow the Tour de France apart. The man they wanted to blow apart was the man in the yellow jersey, 181, Lance Armstrong. They weren't able to do that. Armstrong never panicked. He allowed everybody to attack round him because he knew he could recover and ride well towards the end. A one-on-one -on -one battle here with the champion of Spain and the leader in the King of the Mountains on the last climb of the day. And there's more to come tomorrow with the Col de Tourmalet and the Col d'Obiste, the Col d'Aspin. They'll go through it all again tomorrow, but the only difference about tomorrow is they have about 30 kilometers or more of flatter roads down to the finish in Po. Bad day for Alex Zuller. Every day during the Tour de France could be a bad one, and today it looks as if it has just hit Alex Zuller. He was riding superbly in the early part of the race. He was always alongside Armstrong on the Col de Perisord. He rode with Armstrong to try and bridge the gap earlier on, but in fact now he is cracked and he's having a bad time. Armstrong and Dufo there at the front of this race, really being chased very rapidly now by Ang Cossero, and then Richard Virenc pulling himself up as well. Well, what a recovery by Richard Veronque this is. He's coming right up to these two leaders. He couldn't have possibly imagined he would have seen them again today. But since Armstrong has caught Laurent Dufault, the pace has eased a little bit. Dufault looks over his shoulder. As far as I know, he's never once turned to Armstrong and said, come on, give me a hand here. He's just continuing to ride up under the banners. I think that's the four kilometre to go there. And it is indeed, which means that Escartin must be dangerously close to the three kilometre if he hasn't passed it. Escartin, barring any final explosion of his form at the moment, should stay in front of this race to win the stage this afternoon. But what's more important to him is getting time over riders like Abraham Milano and Alex Zuller. Well, this rider will never give up trying, although he looks to me as though he may have just about hit the wall again. He looks very, very tired, Richard Veronque, just that he seemed to be coming on to the back of, of uh, Angle Casero. I think he's crackball. 
He came up very close indeed, but everybody's almost in the same 20 seconds here. It looks very much as if Angle Casero has managed to pull himself back up to Lance Armstrong and Laurent Dufo, but the man who's still leading the race all on his own for a very long time now, Fernando Escartin, is trying to take it home to Spain. The difference between the leader and the Mayo Jean is about 850 yards on this climb, and that's all it is. And this man is hanging on as best he can now for the finishing line, and that's what his team is okay. telling him. Just keep going, you're nearly there. Even Alex Zuller has recovered over the last couple of kilometres. He too now pulling himself up to the back wheel of Richard Viron, and that's a great move by Zuller. Obviously knows himself very well. He didn't panic when he had that bad patch, but realised he had to get into a rhythm and pull himself back up to Armstrong, which is what he's doing right now. Well, hats off to these men, uh, top professional bike riders they are, but they know what nobody else can understand, and that's how to hurt themselves. When you're a star, that's one thing. To stay in the thick of the action when you're not feeling too good is another. And Zulla has suffered today, and he's still in at the kill. And here comes Kurt van der Waal as well. Kurt van der Waal riding excellently for the Lotto squad. They haven't really been a team that's been dominant in the mountains over the last few years, but with the arrival of this young man and Mario Arts, they are starting to prove that Belgians at long last have got men capable of riding high in the overall rankings. Great comeback by Alex Zuller because now he's on the wheel of Richard Virenk, just as Virenk joins the, the chasing group behind Escartin, the chasing group of the yellow jersey, Lance Armstrong. Rink now can hook up with Casero, and that gentleman's getting in the way a little bit there now as these riders are coming towards the end of what has been a tremendous day's racing in the Pyrenees. There's the Basque flag flying, and that uh, Escartine has gone through now. He's about 800 metres in front of this group, and that is all, but it should be enough. 800 metres is an awful long way on a climb like this. It correlates to approximately two minutes. Armstrong not happy there because that spectator ran up alongside him and tried to stick something onto his back, and he wasn't quite sure what was going on. He took a look along, took a long, hard look at that spectator and told him, just keep away from us, we're doing our job, we're bike riders. And that's, uh, that's true for sure now, as Richard Veronk has come straight to the front. This, this man, one minute, looks terrible, next minute he's pushing the pace. Uh, Dufo, who has been absolutely brilliant today, his acceleration, we'll never forget a couple of mountains back when he took uh, Escartine away. He couldn't master Escartine. Now, look at this, because Veronk has gone, and immediately the Mayo Jean is right on his wheel there, and even Zulla can find the strength. Where does he dig it from? That was a real attack by Richard Virenk, and Armstrong wasn't going to let anybody go clear at all. The timing gap is still exactly the same, Phil. I make it 2.25 under that banner, and that attack by Richard Virenk was very closely mastered by Lance Armstrong and Alex Zuller. Well, tremendous riding, and I think he's going to try and kick again here, but you get that feeling any minute now. The yellow jersey is going to try one himself. He's Escartine now. He likes to hear the noise, but he doesn't want to be touched, and he pushes them out of the way because he's climbing up now to his first ever stage win in the Tour de France after a memorable attack. He's just got to keep going, keep rolling that body of his. It's a very ungainly style, but it's working out to be very efficient for him. His advantage, 2.28 over the group with Lance Armstrong, Zulla and Richard Virenk. Again, Virenk goes to the front, putting the pressure on. They've blown everybody else in the group away, and Virenk now is trying to climb himself up and pull himself with a possibility of finishing second on the stage. The men of the tour today are again, are again cracking as they try to push each other to the limit now. As again, Richard Varenk, he's yo-yoed on and off the lead group all day today, but when he gets back, he just goes to the front and works hard. Right behind Lance Armstrong, then Alex Zulla. And this time, they have cracked Laurent Dufo. He's been in the lead for so long, but he's lost the back wheel now of Alex Zulla. As the race referee there is desperately trying to clear all of the vehicles away from these three riders. There again are the Spanish Basque flags flying, and they've got themselves a Spanish rider in the lead today. Armstrong riding very sensibly here, Phil. He's now able to respond to the attacks. He doesn't want to ride too hard. He's actually thinking about tomorrow's stage. The speed that he responded to Virenk's attack there shows that this man has still got a lot of reserves in hand. He's never once been in serious difficulty today, and today he's just riding to make sure he does the amount of work that's necessary. Laurent Dufo and Nardello here. They've just been distanced just that little bit by the group. They've been giving everything today. 
Every rider has delivered all of his efforts, and we're seeing a real true result in the Tour de France today. This was always talked about as the decisive stage of the Tour. We'll never know that until we look back in Paris, but it's certainly been one of the best, that's for sure. Here's the leader now, Fernando Escartin, climbing towards his first ever stage win, and just over the top of that mountain is Spain, his own country. There's the kilometre kite, 1,000 metres to go to the finish line, and Kelme deserve this victory today, Phil. They went out with a positive strategy. They went out to try and attack the race. From the very first climbs of the day, they went out and they put pressure on Lance Armstrong. They put pressure on the whole race. They sent men out in front, and then that was the, port, the launch pad that Fernando Escartin needed. He came up to his teammates. They worked their hearts out for him, and then he took over, and he's really been successful. Well, a superb piece of riding. He went clear on the climb of the Col de Val Laurent. He went down that dangerous descent and took all the risks he needed to do. They have managed to get back around 30 seconds ever since he attacked on them, and that is nothing today. It has been a superb piece of riding by this man, whichever way you look at it. He hasn't got the time back he would have liked. He knows now the Tour de France will probably not be for him this year because he needed more time today. Tomorrow, the advantage, I think, will swing back to Lance Armstrong. And then, of course, as we go towards Paris on the flatter road, Escartine, well, he won't make any further gains. This was his big car today. He's excited everybody. He's probably going to win with around two minutes. And by the end of it, he might well be up to second overall. Great performance. He's not got far to go now because the last 500 metres of this stage this afternoon actually drops down a little bit to the finish line. He will shortly be taking that right-hand bend and he will know then and feel the relief in his legs as he, as he rolls down at a higher speed towards the finish line. But he went out today with a big plan to try and do something special on this Pyrenean stage. And this performance of his today's Phil certainly has been a special one. And the good news, Fernando, is the last few metres is downhill and the most of today's racing has been uphill. But now the pain is nearly over for him and then he can sit back and watch the clock count down everybody else in. And you are going to see some gaps which will amaze you today. Alana will be one such gap. Pavel Tonkov will be another one. Stefan Erlo will be another one. Those riders are now out of it for a big prize in this year's tour. This is the new piece of road put in by the finisher, the organising committee here at the finish, and now it, feel, it feels a lot easier for Fernando Escartin, and for the next two or three hundred metres he can really savour the victory, which is the first one he's ever had in a Tour de France at eight attempts. It's all downhill to the finish now, they have to just go down to the line, and Fernando has gone through the gears, once again he's in the big gears now, and he's racing, what a wonderful feeling this must be, he give it his all today, breaking away after a tremendous acceleration on the Col de Pera Sword, he went away on his own on the Col de Val Laurent. he has survived, and we'll see by how much in a few minutes time, but right now, this has been a special day for him, all of the training has been worthwhile, in eight attempts, this is his first stage victory in the Tour de France and I think he'll find his second overall as well well this is the first time we have seen Lance Armstrong in difficulty in the Tour de France but it's, uh, what is he 50 meters or so from the top of the climb and he's downhill to the line but he has decided now or he has had no choice he's lost a little bit of ground here on the two who have been on and off the back of him all day today Richard Brenk and Alex Zula it is 1 minute 15 seconds now since Fernando Escardi Escartin won the stage Richard Brenk and Alex Zula men who have suffered today and thought the chances were gone and now they are going to get the better of Lance Armstrong to the line so it's 1.30 now the time gap since Fernando Escartin finished and just coming into view with 300 meters to go Richard Baronk the best of the French riders again in a Tour de France he will be on the overall tonight and Alex Zuller and on the last knockings Alex Zuller is gaining a few seconds and that will be nothing over Lance Armstrong and so they spin to the line, and in fact, Zuller has found the legs to take second. Alex Zuller coming towards the line now, second place, and he's gapped two minutes dead, and 2.01 to Richard Berenk in third. Here comes Lance Armstrong to the line, fourth today. 2.09 his gap on the winner in the end today, and he well keeps his yellow jersey. And the hero of the day, Fernando Escartin, now knows the thrill of a stage win in the Tour de France. And he opened the time gaps as well. Laurent Dufault, who started the move, he finished eighth at 2 minutes 45 seconds. 
and the big loser of the day, Abraham Olano. On this descent of Val Laurent, he crashed and from then on lost big time. He trailed in at seven minutes and one second behind the winner today. So Spain won today and Fernando Escartín will get all of the headlines tomorrow. Let's have a look at the stage result. He beat Alex Zula, Richard Berenk by two minutes and one second. Lance Armstrong just trailing slightly at the end. He comes in two minutes, ten seconds back. And Kurt van der Wauer did a great ride for the Lotto team, taking fifth place today. And it was a good ride too for Chris Boardman, a non-climber. He arrived safely in the big autobus and he arrived over 36 minutes behind the winner. Lantern Rouge, J. Sweet, well, he finished, but although the clock was still running, he has been eliminated tonight, so sadly no Paris for him. And Lance Armstrong is still the leader of the Tour de France, but I bet he's glad this stage is now behind him. This is the new overall situation. Armstrong now leading Fernando Escartín by 6 minutes and 19 seconds. Alex Zulla still lies third at 7.26. Richard Baronk is the best Frenchman in fifth. And Abraham Olano, he plummets now to eighth overall. What a day for changes, and now we can go to Paul Sherwin with Lance Armstrong. You uh, responded to a lot of the early attacks, but eventually when Escartin left, you, uh, you didn't try to follow him. Why? I didn't think he'd get that much time, and uh, we thought it was better to just, just have the guys ride and, and keep him at a reasonable distance, but... He was going fantastic today. I mean, he, he rode like an animal and he deserved to win. And a little sign of weakness at the end when you just got dropped off the back from Varenk and Zulu? Yeah, I paid for my, for my aggression at the bottom of the climb. And, uh, I don't know, the others didn't look so good and Brunil, he told me to attack and just ride my own race. So, but I paid in the end. Yes, but Lance Armstrong still leads the Tour de France tonight. In the two other competitions, in the King of the Mountains, Richard Berenk is still a convincing leader here. While in the Green Jersey points competition, Eric Zabel scored better than Stuart O'Grady today, and he nudges ahead there. And the most marks for acrobatics today? Well, they go to Manuel Beltran of Bernesto as he descended the Col de Val Laurent. Pyrenees, which have played a starring role in the Tour de France since 1910, produced another epic day yesterday. Fernando Escartín, whose ungainly style matched the unevenness of the peaks, rode to his first stage win in eight tours, and he ascended to second overall. But it was not all celebration for Spain. Abraham Olano, who struggled and punctured, lost seven minutes and plunged from second to eighth. In the middle of the fight was the American, Lance Armstrong, he faltered only in the last 300 metres, but after his hardest day, he's still a clear leader in yellow. Overall, he leads Fernando Escartín by 6 minutes 19 seconds, Alex Zula stays third, and Abraham Alano is now over 12 minutes back. And the riders have to face up to all that again now on this final day in the Pyrenees. But what a magnificent day of racing it really was yesterday. And I think the riders did give their all. And even that wasn't enough for the Australian, Jay Sweet. When he got to the finish, he found he'd been eliminated by less than five minutes. So poor Jay won't achieve the ambition of finishing his first tour in Paris. Gary Imlach went to his hotel last night. Just as well he did, Jay was already checking out and heading to his home in Toulouse. Uh, you know, I did it the hard way and I've done it the hard way all week and, uh, you know, just saying goodbyes to, to me teammates and, you know, wishing them the best of luck and they've all said the same thing, that none of them could have done it as long as I did, you know, and kept putting up with with what I did. So, you know, they're all, you know, saying chapeau and congratulations and great stuff. So, uh, you know, it's I'm happy. I did it a lot further than I thought I was going to do, so it's just a pity I couldn't get through... Uh, the next couple of days and get myself to Paris. It is a very intense experience, isn't it, though, the tour? Will it be strange tomorrow when suddenly, abruptly, you're at home watching it on TV? I think so. Um, I was just thinking that before, how am I going to react waking up in the morning 
uh, knowing that I don't have to get up and race today and, you know, watching it on TV and, well, you know, it's life, huh? Um, I'm, you know, and look, I'm still smiling. Uh, I, I'd love to be racing tomorrow, but, you know, it's also, it's nice knowing that I don't have to. I don't have to go through all that, that pain and suffering tomorrow. So, uh, as I said, I'm just, I'm just going to relax. I'll... What's the one abiding memory that you'll take with you from your first tour? The day in the sestry year. <laughs> that was, uh, it wasn't a good memory, but it's going to be the one that's going to stay with me for a long time. I think that was probably one of the longest and, and hardest days of my life. You've got a great reception from the crowd, though, at the end of every stage. Yeah, I've, I think I've, I've made myself a little bit more popular in France anyway. Um, I've got a few fans here now. Uh, which is funny because I didn't get fans from winning races, I got fans from coming last, which is kind of strange. But um, yeah, I think a lot of, a lot of people here, um, wasn't just the, the crowd on the road, you know, all the, the medicine people in the, medicine, in the medical cars, a lot of the press people that follow the stages, even the commissaires in the commissaire cars, uh, all the directors from the other teams were all, you know, cheering for me. I earned a lot of respect this last week from definitely doing it the hard way. See you in Paris next year then. Yeah, definitely. OK, no worries. Well, thanks, Gary, and the best of luck for Jay for the rest of the racing season. What a sad way to end the Tour de France, but there you are. The rollout this morning without Jay Sweet going at 11.37. 142 riders in the field now, and the new Lantern Rouge is Jackie Durand. Well, he's a man who's ridden seven tours. He's had three stage wins, so this will be a bit of a new position for him in the overall classification. One man not with them, though, Manuel Beltran. This was the sensational crash of him yesterday as he started the descent of the Val Laurent climb, and uh, he was lucky, I think, he hit the photographer, otherwise he might have gone a lot further. Well, we're on the slopes now of the Col d'Aspin, a little bit overcast, quite a contrast in conditions to yesterday, and the riders in no hurry at all for their rendezvous with the giant Col de Tourmalet which is the other, other side of this mountain, Paul. They've all ridden together so far, and uh, I must say, pretty steady pace too. The reason is because this first climb after just 35 kilometres of racing is such a long way to go to the finish line, and any of the big attacks or offensives that do come up against Lance Armstrong will certainly come on the Col de Tourmalet, which climbs to 2,100 metres, and it is a very difficult climb. Over here, they can ride together without the fear of too many of the, the teammates getting dropped, but once you get to the Tourmalet, people will just get dropped because of the length of the climb. Well, this is a lovely part of the world today, not too far away from where the riders are right now on the early slopes of the Col d'Aspin are the roads they raced along yesterday, heading down towards the finish at Pioangoli, and uh, that was that great day out uh, for the Spanish rider, Fernando Escartin. He's not going to attack too early today. Once we go down this mountain, there's a descent of about seven miles, and then we run into the beautiful little town of uh, Sainte Marie de Compon. Once we're through there, it's a hairpin left, and then we start the long climb of the Col de Tourmalet, taking the riders up to 2,115 metres. We feel that is where the men will start to attack Lance Armstrong again today uh, to see if he's come through yesterday. He showed a little bit of tiredness towards the end yesterday, and he's lost a little bit of his lead too because he's only just over six minutes ahead now of Fernando Escartin. And once over the Tourmalet, a long, long descent takes him right down to the valley. Then we go over the Col de Soulor and the Col d'Aubis. This is a most famous circuit in the Tour de France, uh, virtually identical to the one first used when the mountains were introduced to the Tour in 1910. And, um, well, the roads weren't quite as well as they are now, Paul, but it, the mountains are just as hard. The mountains are certainly just as difficult as they were, but this Col de Tourmalet really is a very long climb, and the descent down the other side is a very technical one as well. But because of the, dif the distance between the Col de Tourmalet and the Col de Lobisque, Lance Armstrong will hope that his teammates like Frankie Andreu and Pascal Derame have a chance to get back into the action because if he does have any problems on the Col de Lobisque, he's going to need teammates to try and drag himself back into the race on the road to Poe. The weather, though, is ideal for the racing conditions today because there is a slight amount of cloud and there will be a larger build-up later on in the afternoon. There's not much of a wind. In fact, I would say it's a breeze coming from the west-northwest. The temperature, ideal for these guys, 26 degrees Celsius maximum, but at the top of the climbs it will drop down to around about 15 degrees Celsius. And one man, Paul, who's been slipping into the high finishes every day in this tour, and I don't think I've mentioned his name more than once when I called him wrongly in a sprint finish about 10 days ago. Tell us about him. 
Well, the featured rider for today is Daniel Nardello. He's actually a Lombard from the region of Lombardy. He was born near Varese on the Swiss-Italian border. He's 26 years of age and he'll be 27 next year. He's had a total of 14 wins and this is his third Tour de France, but he's ridden the Tour of Italy twice and the Tour of Spain twice. He's not one of the great winners of the peloton with just 14 wins to his credit, but he's always a rider who works very well for the team. In fact, going back to 1993, he was fourth in the World Time Trial Championships, just showing that this is the kind of rider who really is able to, to shine in all terrains. But his biggest real win came in the 1996 Vuelta Tour of Spain when he won a mountain top finish. In fact, he outsprinted his friend and training partner, Andrea Peron. Uh, the following year, he went on to win the Tour of Austria, which shows he's a very good rider because there are a lot of big climbs in that Austrian race, and that was where Kevin Livingstone was revealed as, an in, as a, a good prospect for the future for the United States. He was second in the 1998 uh, National Championships, but really this year he's looking to perform well at the Tour de France. He's currently lying sixth overall. That's his highest position after finishing, finishing eighth last year. And in fact, now after the, uh, the, the defeat of Tonkov yesterday, he's uh, got the chance to be the rider to try and win high ride high in the overall rankings for Team Mappé. They're just coming up here at a very steady pace. Three and a half kilometres to the top. Uh, Chris Borben was on the front in the valleys too, uh, riding at the front with his Credit Agricole teammates because they were trying to get Stuart O'Grady into position to take out the maximum points at the first sprint of the day at uh, Seron Colin at 16 kilometers that wasn't the case sebastian dimarbo or dimarbe from the lotto team he got away just before the sprint and he took the uh, points and eric zabel now sprinting clearly better than o'grady uh, beat stewart to the second place so in fact zabel now has a 12 point lead in that competition in itself it's not a lot uh, but he is very consistent in the way he's beating o'grady Zabel's performance every day when he goes out there, he knows he has to fight for points. He knows he has to finish in front of one man, and that's Stuart O'Grady, and he is consistently doing that. And whether it's one point or ten points, he's always making an advantage of going forward and trying to get as many points as possible before he goes up to Paris, which is why he thinks it's almost more difficult to defend the green jersey than it is to defend the yellow. Well, right now, if anybody's thinking of attacking in the middle of the pack, they haven't got a chance because the riders have blocked the whole road up here and they're determined to keep it nice and steady. Rider down there just passing through. Our picture was Andrea Perron. You probably missed him, but in the yellow jersey, of course, is Lance Armstrong today. Just behind him, it looks like Stuart O'Grady on the polka dot jersey, Richard Veronk. He's making that uh, climbing title his again. It is a very strange way he wins this title, Paul. He doesn't seem to have any challenges. He's won it now, well, it will have won it five years running, not five years running, five times. He would have had a certain challenger if Marco Pantani had been here at the Tour de France, but he does manage to go out and get his main points in the big mountain passes, the, the first and second category climbs and the, the hawk category climbs, which give them an awful lot of points. And that's where you can really win this, this competition if you are dedicated and completely concentrated on going for those mountain points. On your days in the Tour de France, Paul, you would have been feeling pretty happy at the speed right now, right? I would be more than happy. Every rider who's going through a hard time in the Tour de France so far would be, would be pleased for the fact that the race has gone over the Col d'Espin at this very temperate speed. And they'll be realizing then they've got a very serious chance of getting in within the time limit at the end of the day. But in fact, the, uh, the profile of the, the latter part of the stage reminds me of a stage a couple of years ago in 1985 when, in fact, uh, Francois Simon's brother won the stage. The race actually started at the bottom of the Col de l'Obisque, and it was a two-day stage. R Stephen Roach had won the stage in the morning. It was stage yeah. 17. And in the afternoon, Regis Simon, who wasn't a great climber, took off on the Col de l'Obisque and managed to stay clear all the way down into Po, and it was a double-stage victory for the Laradoute squad. That's right, a pretty happy occasion, certainly with Stephen Roach. He was then a winner of the Tour de France, and he went on to win the whole race in the end. Of course, the only Irishman to have done that back in 1987 now. And on that occasion, the big three came his way, the world title and the Tour of Italy as well. And the only other man to have done that is Eddie Merckx back in 1974. Well, we're getting pretty high up now. I keep getting a little bit worried. It's uh, probably that uh, banner we're just going past those three kilometres to the summit. A um, little bit worried about the cloud level because when we get to the top here, we're at 1,489 metres. Itself is not very high for a Pyrenean mountain, but oddly enough, the view here is beautiful on top of the Col d'Aspin under normal conditions, and uh, you really have got a lovely uh, view of the Peak de Midi, but I'm afraid we're not going to see it today, and if the cloud is here at this level, Paul, then we are going to be in the mist probably for the last four or five kilometres of the Tourmalet. 
Tomalea an awful lot higher than the, the Col d'Espan. You get a chance here just to see what these Pyrenean passes are like. They zigzag up these mountains, and it's a wonder sometimes why they actually build roads across these mountains because it really does uh, take you right into the heart of the Pyrenees. And there's an awful lot of wildlife in this area too, which uh, these guys don't have much chance to take time out to look at today. Well, don't forget, it was back in 1910 when it was a journalist uh, who worked for the organizing newspaper Lorto and the granddad of the tour, Henri de Grange, who went out and then sent a telegram back to his boss to say he just managed to go through uh, on the bicycle. He conquered the Col de Tourmalet. It was perfect, and this, the Tour de France, should cross these roads. And Henri de Grange needed no more prompting than that because it was in the route for the 1910 race. And the race won then by Octave Lapitz. Uh, who was in fact more of a sprinter than a climber Still the same situation at the front of the main field none of these guys are very keen to, to set the race going at the moment because there is there are two Very difficult climbs to come after this one the Col de Tourmalet really goes up for an awful long way when you get to the bottom You see a banner telling you there's 23 kilometers to go to the summit and that's around about 14 miles of climbing and the descent down the other side is a very treacherous one, even more treacherous today. I think if the, if the fog is over the top of the climb like that, it does make it even more tricky because you can't read the lay of the land properly when you're coming into a corner, so you can't interpret how the corners are going to be when you come out of them. On the pace of the front, and then you look at the back and the riders here, one or two are finding it quite difficult on the climb here, and they'll be glad of this chance to loosen off the legs after the stiffness, which must have been in them after that terrific day's racing yesterday. Um, and on a day of racing like that, you can only feel sorry for Jay Sweet, who was eliminated by a little more than five minutes because it was such an aggressive age. I thought the organization was pretty hard there uh, with an elimination percentage of only 12%. It was a tough one for Jay Sweet, but that was a very tough mountain stage. And, uh, and fortunately for him, the aggression started very early on. The Spanish team certainly went out on a mission. They had a, a mar in their mind that they wanted to try and blow this race to pieces on its way through Spain and up to that very difficult finish in the ski resort and that is really why Jay Sweet ended up being a casualty of what was an exceptional day's racing. For the moment the Spanish teams must certainly have pretty stiff legs because they were really going for it yesterday. They they put down the they put down the law on the roads of the Tour de France with all those big attacks blowing the race absolutely to pieces. And today they are not gone out quite so quickly but certainly they will have got morale from their performances yesterday. And if Fernando Escartin wants to keep on to his second place uh, before he goes up to Paris, he's going to try and have to get some more time over riders like Laurent Dufault, Virenque, and obviously Olano. Well, there you can see we're just tickling the cloud now as it blows through the valleys. And the whole entourage of the Tour de France making steady but sure progress up towards the top. Richard Virenque, again the leader of the King of the Mountains, he was first over the top of this climb in 1994 and 1995. And uh, it could be a sprint here. And if it is a sprint, well, Robin McEwen will, uh, could uh, show them a nice clean pair of wheels. Not many riders will be able to beat Robin McEwen in a sprint at the summit, but one man who will try to is the man on the left-hand side there in the white jersey with the red spots on it, Richard Virenk, has a very comfortable lead in the King of the Mountains competition at the moment. And in fact, uh, Mariano Piccoli has been very consistent in this competition. He went out over the first week to look for the small points on the third and fourth category climbs, and he's currently lying second overall in that competition, just behind Virenk. And in third place, really, just a matter of course, Lance Armstrong, because of the fact he's been riding at the front of the race throughout the mountains of the Tour de France, is in third place in that standings as well. Well, Lance Armstrong, he's going to feel nervous today because, to him, uh, this is going to be something like the last day of the tour in many ways because the mountains after today will be behind him. He'll bring all of his team back around him for the flat roads to Bordeaux uh, where we should see a sprinter win, but you never know. Of course, a breakaway could go. We're bound to go back into the sunny weather towards Bordeaux. And once we go to Futuroscope, where the tour starts next year, by the way, it's Grand Depart will be there next year. Uh, we're having a time trial there, and at that time trial, well, Armstrong... We'll see how he's come through this last couple of weeks since the last time trial because, uh, you know, if he's tired, then Zuller might take full advantage of him there. But he's, he's lost too much time right now to affect the outcome of the race. He has a great buffer over all of his rivals. But I spoke with Charlie Motte yesterday, a very experienced former Tour de France mm -hmm. rider and aware of the yellow jersey. And he was a little worried about Armstrong going into the last week of this tour because he said that Armstrong came into the Tour de France in such great shape that when you do do that, you in fact have a very difficult time over the last week. So once Lance Armstrong gets to the top of the Col de l'Obisque, he will breathe a big sigh of relief yeah, because then he will almost be able to see the Eiffel Tower on the horizon.
Yes, he's had to fight everything else too. Criticism as well as his uh, fine riding here in this Tour de France. Well, the car's behind thinning out as well because the two of the teams in the race now have only got three men left in. The Seiko Cannondale team, Cipollini's team, down to three. And uh, the other one is Lamprey. They're down to three as well. You can see Mario Piccolini there, the nearest camera in that mauve stripe down the side. Uh, but so once they're down to three, uh, then they eliminate all of their support vehicles except, um, except one. Well, that's uh, par for the course also. A lot of the masseurs and, uh, and the mechanics will also get sent home as well because they don't really need to, to keep hold of three masseurs and three mechanics when they've only got three riders left in the bike race. It is a shame to come to the Tour de France and be in that situation, but teams have been that way before. In fact, a couple of years ago, Lotto dragged themselves through to the finish with just one bike rider left. But this year, many riders are tired in this race, and if you look at the overall classification, you can see how quickly the time gaps are opened. There are now uh, only 42 riders in the event. Uh, that's 100 of them outside of one hour uh, behind Lance Armstrong uh, so far. And at the moment, we have covered uh, in the region of uh, two th uh, 3,030 kilometers right now. Still Robbie McEwen sitting in the middle there. Pretty happy with the way things are unfolding for him today because he knows later on he will suffer on the slopes of the Col de Tourmalet. And there will be a sprint at the top of this climb because Vireng still needs to go out because hovering near the front on the right-hand side in the, the blue and pink jersey there is Mariano Piccoli. He's looking also to try and get himself some points. And he should have the advantage over the top of a climb like this in a straight-out sprint against uh, Richard Vireng, who is on the right-hand side of the bunch, the left-hand side of the picture. Well, there's the rear of the pack. 87 riders have scored points in the King of the Mountains competition this year. Richard Varong has 237 compared to Mariano Piccoli's 168. So that's a good lead for Richard. He's over there on the left. And Piccoli is the pink jersey just tucked in off the right behind the tall Teddy Bourguignon. They're getting a bit twitchy now, so it's, we're starting to move up towards the, the last kilometre. And that is why Richard Varong on the left is looking over. Uh, to the uh, other side to see where Pickley is. That man there is in camouflage. We don't think he's budding now because the mist is catching up. Riding in the middle in the black and yellow jersey there as well of Once. In fact, is André Perron who's riding an exceptional Tour de France. He's ridden himself right up into 11th place in the overall standings just now. And that's despite doing a lot of work for his team leader, Abraham Alano, who was going through all kinds of difficulties yesterday. Virenk now taking much more of an interest at the front of the group here because he realizes that we're getting a lot closer to the King of the Mountains at the summit, and right up alongside him, his closest challenger, Mariano Piccoli. To be anticipated, a one-on-one -on -one sprint here between Veronk and Piccoli, but watch out for the movement that might come up from the left of the picture there, Festina. But I wonder, because I think that uh, Richard Veronk, he's done this so often, controlled the climbers and then sprinted out, but he's going to have a little go, and Robin McEwen is going to have a dig here. He's almost smiling, I think, Robin McEwen. He won't believe this to win the top of the Col d'Aspan, and he's going to show Richard Varenk if it's going to be a sprint, then I'm a lot better than you are. How's about that, Richard? Oh, he's going to move away, Paul, and let him go through. Well, that was a, <laughs> that was a slight blow move by, uh, by Robin McEwen there. He swung across and thought, well, I'm not really fighting for the overall standings here. I'll let the two guys who really are sprint it out themselves. Well, that is amazing. Uh, but that's what happens on the way the race tactics are running in a big race like this. And now McEwen just having a word with Mariano Piccoli and Richard Veronk as they start. Here we are. Now, let's just see if, in fact, McEwen does sit up and allow the two climbers to grab the most points. Watch for the line on the road. He's looking. He's inviting Veronk to come across. And Richard, I think, yes, it will be. He'll be third, I think. It was Veronk and Piccoli getting the mountain climbers points on the Col d'Aspan. So McEwen won't have his name in the record books as being first up the mountain. Well, interesting that uh, Robin McEwen switched across there like that because, in fact, he allowed the two, two men in first and second place to fight it out, and they will fight it out all the way to Paris because I'm sure Mariano Piccoli just edged his wheel across the line in front of Virenk there, and that is going to make that competition fairly interesting over the next few days. So let's see how they go down the hills. It's uh, one kilometre already on the way down. In here in the Pyrenees, by the way, for the benefit of all the touring cyclists, they have the kilometre markers all the way up each side of the mountain. So when you're climbing to the top, at least you know exactly how far to go. Uh, but on the way down, of course, we see the back of the signs heading down towards our second kilometre of the descent. Beautiful descent, this, for, a, for the early part. Long, straight stretches of road. Then we start to herping through the forest as we make our way down to Sainte-Marie de Campon, uh, where we herping round the cafe there. The 
very famous town is that because there's still a plaque there uh, when um, back uh, a few years ago now when Eugene Christophe this is where he broke his forks of course and he walked 14 kilometers to the local uh, forge and the blacksmith made his forks again and then was disqualified because he got somebody else to blow the bellows and all that happened in 1913 there is a plaque in the village actually which tells you that uh, they'll pass through I don't think they'll stop to read it a bit of discussion at the front of the group here uh, the lads uh, asking Robin McEwen what was going on there how come you swung across like that and the reason he did was because he wanted to leave the top guys in the standings to go over there and it looks as if the advantage did go to Piccoli ahead of Varenk well and they also managed to fit uh, Arietta in there somewhere so uh, McEwen must have got fourth uh, on the line well if there had been a, a serious race up the slopes of the Col de Laspin Robin McEwen knows that he wouldn't have been there at all to sprint it out which is probably why he sat up and he will gain a certain amount of credibility from the other riders in the group there for not uh, for not being an opportunist and stealing the glory from the guys who really sprinted out we're getting a chance to have a look at that one more time he led out the sprint and realized that all the big climbers of the Tour de France were fighting it out for a very important competition and he swung off there and I would have to say that uh, Robin McEwen will have been third and I think when the judges look back at that they will see that it should have gone to the Australian well they've placed him fourth at the moment and uh, Lundqvist riding his first tour and we haven't seen the whole race he's over there in fifth at the moment Welcome back. This is the last official feed station before the start of every stage of the Tour de France. This is the ritual the riders go through before they actually go up to the start line. Even though the teams have given them enough food and drink for the day, there's nothing wrong with taking an extra bottle of water and some fresh fruit. The great thing about fresh fruit is despite the weather conditions out here on the Tour de France, it's always easy to eat. This fruit normally is reserved just for the riders. Well, I hope they've fueled up well for today because they're now on the climb of the Col de Tourmalet. This is the long one. It's almost 18 kilometers uphill. The attack started pretty soon after the climb started when eight riders got clear, led by Pavel Tonkov, who really isn't a big uh, hitter anymore in the Tour de France. He's now 19 minutes off the yellow jersey, but you never know. He was joined by Echeverria, the stage winner a couple of days ago, Roland Meyer of Cofidis, Stefan Garzelli, Alberto Eli, uh, Andrea Peron is having a great tour, Fabian Yecker and Cesar Salon, who's from the Bonesto team. Yecker has been dropped, but there are now seven riders in the lead. A couple of Kelme riders trying to catch them up. Here's the lead is now led by Tonkov and the yellow jersey of Lance Armstrong. He's had to come to the front a little bit earlier than I think he would have liked. He's there with Richard Veronk, but they're riding Paul 40 seconds behind and the race now being driven by Tonkov. Tonkov trying to get some kind of revenge on his performance from yesterday because he was hoping to ride himself in the top five in the overall standings of this Tour de France and the whole of the Mape, um tactics this year have been to look after this man to try and bring him up to Paris either as the winner or at least on the podium and losing all of the time that he did yesterday he has to come out today and try and do something special the amazing thing about Tonkov though when you look at his pedaling style he, he never looks as if he's really going very fast he climbs with a huge gear and that may be why he suffered yesterday well, they're slowly but surely breaking up that leading seven. Eli Tonkov and Echeverria going clear here. Here is the champion of Spain, uh, Casero, now trying to rev up the main field here. And I think that uh, the yellow jersey of Armstrong will be pretty pleased about that uh, because he might need a little bit of help today to get up to the leaders. Kevin Livingston tried to psychologically psych out the rider from the, the Pulte squad on the front there to try and slow him down. They don't want to ride up this climb so fast at all. Livingston riding alongside him in a, a hope that he could discourage the speed that was being set there. It didn't work, so he's let him go, and he sat up and gone back to ride alongside Lance Armstrong. Meanwhile, up the road, it's still Tonkov setting the pace, but the group of Armstrong now starting to close down on the riders being left behind from this leading group. And Casero is trying to go across on his own here, but he's being slowly wheeled in. He's looked over his shoulder. We're getting a very select little group forming there. Now that's Fabian Yecker who's coming back on the right. He was with the leaders. He's trying to find his legs again now to lift them up and go forward once more. The best placed man in that front group is Andrea Peron, but he also, I think, is coming back now, leaving Tonkov, Echeverria and Alberto Eli as the three riders up front. 
Well, Richard Varenk was the first man to actually attack Lance Armstrong on the slopes of this climb, and it's obviously had a major effect on the group because they're down to around about 20 men in this group now, and Livingston looking across, having a quick word with Varenk. Livingston coming straight to the front to set the tempo, but obviously as soon as the numbers start to be reduced, we see the big names of the Tour de France in the white jersey. There is Alex Zuller. There's the winner of yesterday in the green and white, Fernando Escartin, and Armstrong still sitting in the middle there very comfortably in his yellow jersey. Well, we've been ascending now uh, since the village of Santa Marie de Compon uh, for 11 or 12 kilometers now, and we're starting to tickle the cloud line because we are now at the height that we were at the top of the Col d'Aspin, but we still have some seven kilometers still to climb here. A break up not due to the weather at the moment, but due to the fact we've just gone into this little uh, tunnel which protects the road from the snow of the winter. And there's a view uh, further up the climb, and it looks pretty good. It's amazing. The riders will climb through the cloud and get up to the sunshine at the top of the Col de Tourmalet. Once again, though, Lance Armstrong's teammates with him have been reduced because of the speed at the bottom of this climb, the Col de Tourmalet, and he's now just got Kevin Livingston with him. And we are hearing that not too far behind, in fact, is Tyler Hamilton, who may recover and get himself back up alongside Armstrong before the summit of the climb. I must say that Livingstone is looking pretty good at the moment. And so too is the sun on top of the Col de Tourmalet. A nice crowd, very orderly crowd, all barriered off there, waiting for the arrival of the leaders. Well, at the moment, I'd like to see Tonkov Echeverria and Alberto Eli. They've started the attacks of the day. Those that join them, here they are. Tonkov was the man. He went clear originally with Echeverria and was brought back. Peron has just tacked on the back of the group. There he is now. So the Onse boys getting a very strong hand here. Roland Meyer, he was originally with the break, has been dropped. Looks like he's coming back, Paul. Well, that's because Tonkov, who initially attacked several times to get himself away from that larger group, has slowed down and, sl and settled down into his own personal rhythm. Laurel and Meyer has been very aggressive over the last few days. He's trying to get as much publicity for po as possible for Kofidis, and if he can get himself up to this group, this group may well go a long way to staying clear for the rest of the day. Well, they've now been climbing for 12 kilometres, and we've now got uh, five riders reforming at the front. And we're waiting for the time check back to the yellow jersey. But, uh, in fact, Meyer here just not lifting the pace enough to get onto the back wheel there of Alberto Eli. If he doesn't get on quick, I think he'll find that he'll go and he'll drop back. Great performance by Andrea Peron, who this year really has worked as a domestique for Abroham Milano. He's currently lying 11th in the overall standings, and another good breakaway by him today could put him very high up in the top 10. In the main field, though, it's still the same situation. Kevin Livingston sitting there in second position, waiting to take up the pacemaking for Lance Armstrong, but there's an awful long way to go to the top of this climb. The yellow jersey group at the moment is uh, 50 seconds behind the leading group, which is uh, five riders if Roland Mayer can just get onto the back of it. And in between, we have got some Kelme riders who went off on the attack. Our old regulars, Contreras was clear, uh, but we haven't, um, we haven't seen them since they actually went away, but we'll wait and see. Stefan Goubert on the front from the Pulte squad. He's keeping the pace high to try and look after his man, Richard Virenk. Virenk obviously wants to get as many points as he can on this last really big mountain stage today. That's the composition of the race at the moment. The leaders 25 seconds ahead of the, the Kelme riders in the middle and then 50 seconds back to Lance Armstrong. And they, well, I'm just listening to the radio there. They're giving uh, already the main body of the peloton nearly two minutes behind since this climb started. So Armstrong had to go with the counter move. He wasn't too worried about the composition of the leading move because the men most nearest to him are still in the breakaway in the chase group here with him. Escartine is the rider to the right of our picture. And also here is Alex Zula. We've seen him occasionally set the pace. He's dropped back at the moment. No sign again of Abraham Olana, but really he's no longer a contender for final victory now, having had his bad ride yesterday. He's now almost 12 minutes away off the pace. Abraham Olana always suffering when it comes to the big mountains of the Pyrenees. He felt that he was a lot better in the Pyrenees than the Alps, but yesterday certainly wasn't a great day for him. Even though he did have some mechanical problems, he still never really was in at the kill over the top of the mountains. They're now climbing through the town called La Mangie, and very shortly they'll climb out of the clouds up towards the summit of the Col de Tourmalet. Well, this is just short of five kilometres from the summit now, La Mangie, and it's a very popular town for the spectators, and just look at them here now as the riders climb through, as they have done since 1910, and setting the pace, the champion of Spain, but these are not the leaders, remember, these are the boys who are trying to get on terms. Oh, sorry, this is Goubert at the front at the moment, the... Uh, 
Pulte rider, not the champion of Spain. He's in here somewhere, Casero. Kevin Livingston is very happy to have somebody else set the pace at the front there, just sitting comfortably in second position. Livingston really is turning out to be an incredible lieutenant for his leader, Lance Armstrong, in the mountains. He's always there, he always digs deep, and he's always setting a pace which is comfortable to follow. These riders coming back from the leading group, this is Stefano Gazzelli, the leader of the Mercatoni Uno squad, a man that many feel could one day emulate the performances of Marco Pantani. Although he's not a great climber like Pantani, he is a good winner of races. The leading group now, Phil, is down to just three riders, so obviously Roland Mayer never managed to quite make it, and in fact, Andrea Perron also has been dropped as they came through the Mongi. Yes, uh, Perron just got on, and the road uh, kicked up a little bit, as it does through the town here, gets quite steep, and uh, Perron has gone backwards again. There is Abraham Olano. And over on the far right there, well, that's a little bit unusual. Michael Bogard, we've hardly mentioned him, Paul, since his crash uh, way back now on day three of the race. Number 41 in the orange and white of Rabobank there is the man who many thought would be a great challenger in this year's Tour de France, and many put his name down as a possible winner of the race overall. But that really bad day on day three over the Pachos au Gua, where he lost more than six minutes, really affected him psychologically, and he never really was in this bike race. But today he's hoping to ride to the front of the Tour de France and stay in a group of 30 or 40 riders and get himself a chance to bring Rabobank a stage victory. Well, at least he hasn't given up the Tour despite all hope of winning it. But he's riding behind the Mayo Jean group at the moment. It has split on the climb as Kevin Livingstone here, thinking only of his team leader, keeps up this pacemaking and he really has done well this year. But he'll just try to keep the pace sensible right now because there's no immediate worry about those riders who are out in front, Tonkov, Echeverria and Alberto Eli. Tonkov is 12th at 19 minutes now, Echeverria is 13th at 20 minutes, and uh, Alberto Eli is 22nd at 28 minutes. So there's no reason to panic yet. And once over the top of the Col uh, du Tourmalet, it's a long, long way down to the valley floor. They descend from 2,115 metres uh, to rock bottom at 383. Uh, so there'll be plenty of time to repair the damage on the way down before they start the climbs of the last two calls of the day, the Col du Soulor and the Col de Bisque. Looking at Kevin Livingston here, you can see he's completely recovered from that accident that he had on the stage to Sestriere when he was then still up alongside Lance Armstrong and the very dif difficult descent off the Mont Genevre was raining and it was wet on the descent and he came down in the corner and he was in really diff real big difficulty for a couple of days but he's managed to recover, he's been looked after properly by the team and now for the last big mountain stage of this year's Tour de France he's up doing the job that we saw him do very well last year for Bobby Julik. And we're still uh, tickling the cloud, but it looks to me towards so the sun is coming through now as we get towards the summit. We've seen the top is bathed in sunshine, and the riders will be above the clouds now, looking down on them, in fact. Escartine, you can never tell from this man's style whether he's suffering or whether he's trying, because it's an ungainly style, but he never changes it, whatever condition he's climbing the mountain in. Uh, but he looks as though he hasn't suffered any ill effects in that brilliant escape he had yesterday. Fernando Escartin for many years, a, a, a real faithful domestique for Tony Rominger on his way to winning two tours of Spain and also on his way to performing very well at the Tour de France. He, once Tony Rominger retired, was given a free hand to ride for himself and he's ridden successfully and he really is looking to try and take out a win in the Tour of Spain. But today he's really showed that this year he's prepared perfectly for the Tour de France. He's right up in the overall standings really six minutes 19 seconds behind Lance Armstrong but he could really do with a little bit more time between himself and Alex Zuller if he wants to keep hold of that second place with still a very long time trial to come these are the leaders now Tony Rominger by the way sitting very close to us here at the finishing line in pro today working for his television network as is Marino Lajaretta another great climber uh, from Spain who's also commentating here today they know all about these climbs and from the front as well Pavel Tonkov the Russian rider is the man setting the pace here followed by little David Echeverria, the man who can do most things well and could well be a future winner of the Tour de France. He's won a stage this year and he's riding fairly high as well, 13th overall. Alberto Eli also having a great tour as well and Eli riding from the 22nd position in the tour so far. But it looks as though these guys are suffering, Paul. They certainly are. Tonkov doesn't show very much emotion on his face and he's a very strong rider. His climbing ability really comes from the, the strength that he's got in the lower part of his back and his big thighs because he's not the, the typical build of a climber. He's such a big rider, but he manages to get up because he can turn bigger gears than anybody else on the slopes of this mountain.